the network of the 1987 World Series. Presents Monday Night Baseball. Tonight from Riverfront Stadium, it's the San Francisco Giants against the Cincinnati Reds. Giants outfielder Jeff Leonard is off to his best start ever, hitting 350, leading the National League in hits. His counterpart with the Reds, Eric Davis, has captured the attention of the baseball world, playing like a superstar both offensively and defensively. Tonight, the Reds and Giants open a three-game series with first place in the National League West at stake. Welcome to Riverfront Stadium. The opening of a three-game series between the Reds and the Giants. The first meeting between these two clubs. Before it's all over this year, they will meet 18 times. The Reds with a two-game lead in the National League West, but you can see six games separate the top five teams in the division. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary Bender. We're just very pleased to have you with us. Cincinnati's concerned about something. The last two years, they've had a tough time in head-to-head -head competition with the eventual division winners. Two years ago, the Dodgers, they were 7-11. And last year against Houston, which, of course, won the NL West, they won only four of the 18 games. They'd like to turn that around today. And Tim McCarver, I guess a lot of people would ask this. Is this the second edition of the Big Red Machine? Everyone's saying this is a glamour team, young players coming along very quickly. Is that fair? <laughs> Odd the inevitable comparisons. It seems like baseball does that more than any other sport. No, it's not fair. It's no more fair than comparing Eric Davis to Willie Mays. I mean, after all, Willie Mays is a Hall of Famer, and the Big Red Machine in the 70s won four pennants, two world championships. Now, granted, this big, this, uh, I was going to call them the Little Red Machine, the Cincinnati Reds of today have a ton of talent. They have Eric Davis, Paul O'Neill, Tracy Jones, Barry Larkin, some great young talent, but they've yet to come to fruition. Now, you look at this giant ball club, they are just besieged by injuries. Their infield, for instance, has played together only 43 innings. I'm a, really an admiration of Roger Craig. He just keeps wiring this team together, and they keep winning. Well, I think the pitching staff's an example of that, too, Gary, as you look at Roger Craig. Roger, being a pitcher himself, is, has a pretty good idea about how to work a pitching staff that has gone through some problems. And the most recent problem, Mike Kruko, just recently put on the disabled list and Eddie Milner reactivated. I mean, after all, the uh, Giants broke with the rotation, as every team does. But only Kelly Downs has... Uh, avoided the bullpen or the disabled list all season long. Well, Mike Lacoste will be starting for the Giants, the right-hander. He's won six games thus far, and Cincinnati hopes that left-hander Tom Browning can get it together. He has been struggling, as you can look at his numbers there. Tim and I will be back to set the starting lineups for this game between the Reds and the Giants in just a moment. <laughs> Monday Night Baseball is brought to you by the heartbeat of America today Chevrolet by Coors Light the silver bullet there's no slowing down with the silver bullet by Kellogg's company maker of Kellogg's frosted flakes Tony's flakes of corn with a sweet frosting and by Quaker State Motor Oil Quaker State people reaching for the best Let's take a look now at the San Francisco starting lineup. Leading off will be 36-year-old third baseman Chris Spire. Batting the number two spot, second baseman Robbie Thompson. Jeff Leonard having a fine year, batting third in the left field. Candy Maldonado batting cleanup. Chili Davis in center field. He'll be in the fifth position. Bob Melvin will do the catching for the Giants. Will Clark will be the first baseman. Batting in the eighth position and playing shortstop, the rookie Matt Williams and Mike Lacoste, a right-hander pitching for San Francisco. And the ex-red pitcher will be backed up. I should say Tom Browning will be backed up by Cal Daniels in left field, Eric Davis in center, and Dave Parker, one of the finest outfields in the major leagues. We're seeing actually six great outfielders tonight. In the infield, Buddy Bell, who has won the Gold Glove six times at third base. Barry Larkin, the shortstop. Ron Oster, a Cincinnati product at second. Nick Kosaski at first base. Bo Diaz behind the plate. And on the mound, Tom Browning from Casper, Wyoming. He's got a four and six record of rather gaudy 7.49 ERA. As a matter of fact, for pitchers that have worked 
more than five games this year. His ERA is the highest in the league. Only Bob Nepper of the Astros has one higher. And he's looking for his first win, Timmy, since May 13th. It's been ineffective not throwing inside, and according to Pete Rose, has not been throwing with any kind of aggressiveness. He's really been very tentative, as Chris Spire will lead it off for the Giants, and he takes the first pitch for a ball. Chris Spire, 36 years old. He'll be 37 late this month. And what a year he is having for San Francisco. Fly ball, right field. Dave Parker coming in, drifting back as Ron Oster, and Oster will put it away. One down, and that'll bring up Robbie Thompson. Thompson, last year having such an outstanding rookie year for the Giants, second in the rookie of the year balloting to Todd Worrell. He's been having a lot of back trouble, Tim, and they're concerned that it may be a chronic problem. Well, the infield of the San Francisco Giants, Roger Craig, has put 24 different combinations in 55 games. He swings on the first pitch. He pops it up, first base side. Hustling over there, Nick Osaski, and Osaski will put him away. So very quickly now, two up and two down. That'll bring up Jeffrey Leonard. Talk about having good years. Jeffrey Leonard has led the National League in hitting most of the year. He's second now behind Tony Gwynn. Never has he gotten off to such a good start. And if he stays healthy, no telling what his numbers will end up being. He leads the majors in hits with 77. And he's tied for the lead in doubles with 20. What a comeback. Four surgeries within six months from August to January. I went through it. I'd sound like, what, Dr. Casey. And he swings on the first pitch. They're wasting no time. Back goes the Sasky. He has it on the foul line, and it's three up and three down. So Browning goes through the top of the first very easily. No score by the Giants, and the Reds coming to back. The Cincinnati Reds, who have been pounding the baseball, and what a lineup they have. Cal Daniels hitting 322, a leadoff in left field. Barry Larkin, the shortstop, batting second. The remarkable Eric Davis batting third. Dave Parker, 235 consecutive games, will be in right field. Buddy Bell with a hamstring problem, still at third base. Nick Osaski, who's been very hot with the bat, will be followed by Bo Diaz catching, batting in the eighth position, the second baseman Ron Oster, and then Tom Browning, who had only four pitches and was out of the top of the inning. He'll be going for Cincinnati. And the defense for the Giants, Jeffrey Leonard in left field, Chili Davis in center, Candy Maldonado, primarily a pinch hitter last year, led the Giants in assists with 10, the outfielders. Chris Byer at third, Matt Williams the shortstop, Robbie Thompson at second, Will Clark at first, Bob Melvin, and what a job he has been doing behind the plate, holding the runners, or at least catching them, stealing, and Mike Lacoste on the mound. Mike's had a good year, he's six and two. He has started seven games, and he's been in the bullpen for seven games. Mike Lacoste, the ex-Red Leg. He's a sinker ball pitcher, and he will start Cal Daniels out with a strike. And it was a breaking ball. And the book on Lacoste is sinker and splitter. So a lot of times the pitcher, what he'll try to do is establish something else like that by throwing something other than that on the first pitch. Cal Daniels with 11 home runs, 25 RBIs. Lacoste got kind of a nasty streak into him. He will challenge you up there, and this time he misses, and the count now goes to two and one. When you look at the leadoff position for Cincinnati, between this guy, Cal Daniels, and Tracy Jones, they have 15 home runs and 37 RBIs. That's impressive. Daniel, fly ball, left center field, hustling back as Leonard, and he made the catch! Oh, what a catch by Leonard! He had a chance to get there, let alone make the grab. That ball was hit hard. I'll tell you what, Gary, we did the game here last week, of course, for ABC, and Cal Daniels had two balls caught by the St. Louis Cardinal left fielder Vince Coleman against the fence. And now to open up this ball game, Jeffrey Leonard, who was a basketball star, he went to Overbrook High School in Philadelphia, the same high school that Wilt Chamberlain went to. Looked like Wilt on that one. I tell you, Wilt have been proud of that one. That'll bring up Barry Larkin at that remarkable catch. That ball was hit so hard, he had very little time to react, but he got there. One ball, the count on Larkin. Larkin hitting 208, four home runs and 13 RBIs, grounded foul. 
third base side and the count evens at one and one. Larkin is the guy that Pete Rose says we've got to get started. He's had moments but not the kind of hitting they expect from him. The former Michigan standout. One down and a one one pitch by Lacoste grounded to second. Robbie Thompson will come up with it to Will Clark and there's two up and two down. And that'll bring up Eric Davis and every time he's announced there's a buzz in the crowd. He's creating so much excitement of baseball. Davis hitting 326, 20 home runs, 23 stolen bases, 55 RBIs, which is second only to Andre Dawson, who has 57. And he's taken away four home runs defensively. Jack Clark doesn't even want to speak to him anymore. Neither does his old buddy Daryl Strawberry of the Mets. So with two down, Lacoste pitches and a ground ball foul. Third base side, Chris Spire over there to backhand it. I think I told you this, uh, Tim. That's my ex-neighbor, Chris Spire, lived next door to me. What yep. a great guy he is. Roger I had to move out of the neighborhood, though. He wouldn't let me stay. Roger Craig thinks he's a good guy. I'll tell you that. He has done some kind of job for the Giants. One strike to count on Davis. <laughs> Call strike two. Lacoste challenging Davis. Eric Davis with three Grand Slam home runs. The player of the month in both April and May of the National League. Two strikes on him, but two out. Oh, 2 pitch, and he misses high, and the count goes to one and two. Davis has that wonderful attitude. A couple of weeks ago, when he hit that National League record with three Grand Slams, you know, he said, what about the time I struck out in Houston nine straight times? He's got a level head, doesn't he? Misses in the count even to two and two. Well, the one thing that I think is going to make Eric Davis a superstar other than his talent is the fact that he's hungry. And he can't say that about a lot of gifted athletes. He wants it. Ah! Call strike three. And so Lacoste sets him down on order. That's his first strikeout. Three up and three down. Lacoste and Browning very effective in the first inning. After one at Riverfront Stadium, no score in this battle of the National League West. We began the top of the second inning. No score from Riverfront Stadium. Candy Maldonado having the best year of his career. Look at those numbers. 40 RBIs. Eight game-winning RBIs this year. As Browning, who had only four pitches in the first inning, starts him out with a strike. Maldonado last year was a pinch hitter deluxe for the San Francisco team and earned the right now to be a regular in right field. One strike, and this pitch misses and evens at one and one. He was the most valuable player on the Giants ball club last year, picked by his teammates, and he didn't earn a starting assignment until August 10th. 1-1 one, one pitch lined up the middle for a base hit. So Maldonado starts things out with the first hit of the ball game here in the top of the second. And that'll bring up Chili Davis. Maldonado last year had 17 pinch hits. And here in the regular roll, bangs out yet another hit. The first three outs recorded were on pop-ups the other way. Browning gets that fastball downstairs, and Maldonado catches up with it. But not the first three hitters. By the way, Pete Rose saying that it's always a good sign when hitters are hitting the ball back over the Reds dugout when Browning's pitching. That means he's throwing the ball hard. Says you got to stay alert. Mm -hmm. Bruce Fremming is behind the plate calling balls and strikes. Charlie Williams is at first. John Kibler down at second and at third base. Tom Hallion as Chili Davis has a one ball no strike count on him. Aldonado with his lead at first. There's a pop up behind the plate and the count evens at one and one. One ball, one strike on Davis. Davis hit his seventh home run of the year yesterday. This team has hit 69 home runs. That's third in the National League. You've got to be doing some things pretty well. you got a lot of people hurt. you got to make up it with it in other areas. And that's what San Francisco has done. Maldonado is lead at first. 1-1. One, one, nobody out here in the top of the second. And that pitch misses outside. 2-1. 
Davis, one of those guys who is a streak hitter. When he gets on a streak, he is as hot as anybody you'll ever watch. A switch hitter. Check of the runner, Maldonado's going to throw by Diaz, and in there with a stolen base is Maldonado. San Francisco has not been that successful running this year, but Maldonado got that one. As a matter of fact, they have the worst percentage in the National League, only 53% of the time. The first screwball from Tom Browning of the ball game, and a bad throw by Bo Diaz. In fairness to Bo, that ball was down. It was not a good pitch to handle, but a lot of times good pitches to handle are good pitches to hit, too. Giants have only been able to successfully steal 53% of their bases as Davis fouls it back, and the count now stays at two and two. So Maldonado down in scoring position. Nobody out, top of the second inning. The reason for that low percentage in stolen bases, Roger Craig likes to hit and run a lot with everybody but his outfielders. And on the hit and run, you don't, you're not compelled to get a good jump from first base. Consequently, you're vulnerable. Grounded foul, third base side, and the count stays at two and two. What you like about the San Francisco team, Tim, is their positive attitude, and that comes directly from Roger Craig. I was a teammate of Rogers back in 1964. And then he was traded during the offseason and became a member of the Cincinnati Reds in 65. He's been in professional baseball 37 years. Browning's 2-2 pitch on the way. And it's full now, 3-2. Davis wearing number 33. He started the year with number 30. But then Roger Craig took Greg Menton's old number, 38, which is the number he had played in. And then Davis decided he wanted 33. He can figure all of that out. That confuse you a little bit? Uh-huh. Three, two. Grounded to short. Larkin handcuffs him, goes into left field. Maldonado had to hold up, but now he goes to third. He wasn't sure where that ball was. He ends up at third base. Runners now at first and third, and nobody out. That's going to be ruled a base hit. That ball was hit sharply. And should be a base hit. Hit to the right of Barry Larkin. Maldonado retreats to second base, and then he can't find the ball. Daniels in left field, recovers in time to almost get Maldonado at third base. But Candy was standing on the bag. The ball trickled in the left field, and he didn't know where the ball was. Well, that ball really shot out of there after Larkin tried to come up with it. Bob Melvin is up. Big, strong catchers hit seven home runs this year. Outside, and the count goes to 1-0. So something doing now for the Giants in the top of the second. Two base hits and a stolen base. Maldonado at third. Chili Davis leads off the first. Pitch by Browning. Strike call and the count goes to one and one. Melvin is having his best year. He's already surpassed his home runs of a year ago when he hit five. Seven. He started out hitting four home runs in the first seven games of the year. Counting the pause of the belt. 1-1 one, one pitch. Wing and a miss, and it's 1-2. and two. Is that that screwball? That was it. It's the third screwball that Tom has thrown. But clearly, he came out to establish his fastball. He learned that screwball in the instructional league back in 1983 and it's a good one one two pitch now to melvin rounded to second oster down he can't come up with the ball and he's safe at first and a run score oster had time to make the force at second couldn't get the ball out they're going to rule that a base hit as well. Well, the reason that I think that should be ruled a base hit is I don't think an infielder should be penalized for making a good play. The reason that Oster couldn't get the ball out of his glove to go to second and then eventually went to first base was because it was a short hop and he couldn't pick it out cleanly. So he was almost penalized by the official score for making a good, a good stop to his left. So we have three base hits in this inning, and one run is in. One to nothing, San Francisco, and that's going to bring up Will Clark, the first baseman who has a nine-game hitting streak going. Left-handed batter looks at a pitch inside. So after breezing through the first inning, Browning 
having some sharply hit ground balls against him, and he's in difficulty. One run is in. Davis leading off a second. Melvin at first. Three consecutive hits. And the count goes to 2-0. Two, oh. two balls, no strikes. Boy, when you're struggling, you need all the defensive help you can get. He's not only struggling, Browning has been struggling early. He's given up 11 first inning runs in his 12 starts. And here the Giants, a golden opportunity for a big inning. 2-0 pitch, and he's behind now, 3-0. Three, oh. three balls, no strikes, nobody out, a run in, and runners at first and second base. There is, at second base, Chili Davis. And at first base, Bob Melvin. 3-0, and now backing out is Clark as he looks down to Don Zimmer. What a funny man Don Zimmer is. I haven't been around him that much, Tim. He's a joy, isn't he? He certainly is. Ex-Brooklyn Dodger, ex-Cincinnati Red. Played for the Chicago Cubs. They call him Popeye, and there's a strike. So on a 3-0 pitch, taking all the way was Clark. Pete Rose, hoping somehow Browning could get out of this. He is looking for another starter, and he hopes Browning could come back to that 21 season of two years ago. Yesterday, Jerry Royce had a long day in that loss to Los Angeles. Ground ball, first base. The Saskia will go unassisted, and the runners advance to second and third base. So they get the first out of the inning. Davis now moves down to third. Moving to second base is Bob Melvin. One out, and that brings up Matt Williams, the rookie shortstop. He's been struggling at the plate, hitting 186 coming into this game. But playing very well defensively. Now Scott Breeden, the pitching coach, comes to the mound to talk to Tom Browning. There's a baseball adage that says usually when a pitching coach comes out in situations like this, he'll tell the pitcher, don't give him anything good to hit, but don't walk him. And you hate to put a pitcher and a catcher in a situation like this. The one thing the Reds have to be alive for right now is the possibility of a squeeze. Roger Craig loves that play. There are some managers that obviously love it more than others. But what makes it more of a possibility now is the fact that Matt Williams is struggling. I mean, after all, he's only been in professional ball one year. This time last year, he was playing for the University of Las Vegas. Number one draft pick out of UNLV. He tore up the Cactus League and then called up due to the injuries and just hasn't quite been ready to make the transition. They're going to walk in. Well, I think Scott Breeden and Pete Rose took the burden off Browning's back by asking him what he wanted to do. And he said, I'd rather walk him and pitch to Lacoste. So Matt Williams will load it up after they intentionally give him the transportation to first and Browning in a real jam now with one out. We'll have the bases loaded. There's already one run in. Well, Lacoste has had some good days at the plate. And there he is. He'd like to help his own cause. Coming into this game, he's two for 19. Hasn't driven in a run thus far. But could he help his cause now? As trotting down to first goes Matt Williams. What do you expect here now? Well, the same, the same thing applies. The squeeze is not as much in effect with the bases loaded because there's a forced play at home. There's no tag play. So the squeeze is as much in order now as it was with Matt Williams. And I guess the controversy mildly arises about whether you walk a 186 hitter or not. Bases full, a pitch to Lacoste, and he's out on front, and he swings for a strike one. It's kind of one of those to-be-continued moves. You see what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason he's pitching and not yeah, batting, right? right. <laughs> Mike Lacoste, six foot four. One strike on him, one out, bases jammed, one run is in. And it hit him. Oh, nor did it hit the bat. It hit him. That's going to drive a run in. Boy, when you're struggling, you really struggle, don't you? So the hit batsman produces the second run of the game. The interesting thing, watch Lacoste's reaction after Browning hits him. He glares out at Lacoste. It does hit him in the left knee. Now look at Mike. He's glaring out there as though Lacoste uh, Browning did it on purpose. It, it's probably a reaction to the pain than it is to anything reasonable. I guarantee you're not going to hit the opposing pitcher. No, on no, purpose. the base is loaded. No <laughs> way. You're kidding me. No way. Well, Spires up. He popped up the first time. 
Run is in and a fly ball right field foul. Two grand slams in the month of May and he almost had another one to tie Eric Davis. Chris Spire. There's only one other major league player that went longer between grand slams. Chris hit his first one back in 72 and then another one this May. Five days apart when he did it. Fastball misses and the count goes to one and one. Two runs are in. Three base hits. A walk. A hit batsman. It's been a very unusual inning. Davis leading with three grand slams. Chris with two. Dawson and Moreland. Moreland starting to heat up now for the Cubs. 1-1 to Spire. Ground ball. Larkin will go to second. They got the force there. They do not double up though and another run scores. Melvin scoring and it's a three to nothing game. Well the speed of the ball would dictate a double play but not when Barry Larkin has to go three strides to his left. That's why it's not a double play ball. Oster tried to desperately turn it but Spire beats the throw easily at first base and an RBI number 18 for Chris Spire. So the eighth man up in this inning Robbie Thompson will come up he popped up to the first baseman the first time and there's a fly ball right field going to drop in for a base hit another run is scored RBI single for Thompson and the ninth man now will come up in the inning. Well the Reds have been a good catch up team and they're going to have to do that again. That was easily done by Robbie Thompson his 18th RBI of the year. And that'll bring up Leonard, the ninth man to come to bat in the inning. Well, I think a reasonable question would have to be walking a 186 hitter with the pitcher coming up next. And no. then hitting. Arguably, that could have led to the three runs. But Pete and Scott Breeden gave Browning, it appeared, the option of pitching to him or not. And he elected to walk him. Grounded foul down on top of the plate. Jeff Leonard popped up. That was an easy first inning for Browning. All of a sudden now it's falling apart. There's Frank Williams, a former giant, traded over to Cincinnati for Eddie Milner, who's been activated for tonight's game. He's a side armor, and he's going to have to heat up in a hurry because Browning still one out away from getting out of a very big inning. Four runs thus far on four hits. And there's still two men on swinging strike, and the count goes to two strikes. That's a screwball again. At least he's getting that over. But a guy that has struggled with the earned run average over seven, not helping his cause here in the second inning. 0 2 pitch, foul back. Well, the two pitchers going against each other tonight. In complete contrast, Browning is a slow starter, and he finishes strong. Mike Lacoste was nine and three last year before the All-Star break and one and ten after the break. Browning's 0-2 pitch grounded to third. Buddy Bell will go to second for the force. But it's been a big inning for the San Francisco Giants. Four runs on four hits and they leave two. They got the bottom of the second. San Francisco leads it four to nothing. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. Mets and Cubs at Wrigley this afternoon. Bottom of the ninth inning. Doug Fisk on the mound for the Mets. The pitch. And Manny Trio with a man on. Parks it to left field. A souvenir for the bleacher bums as the Cubs win it 4-2 on Trio's fourth home run of the year again. Chicago 4, New York 2. Back to Gary and Tim. Well, that's Manny Trio who kind of replaced Chris Spires, the utility man for the Cubs this year, hitting that big home run. Dave Parker now as the Reds have to play some catch up but they have been very good at doing that they've won 16 of 31 games this year when trailing and from the seventh inning on they've outscored teams 90 to 37 and I'm sure Pete Rose would like to have that happen again tonight as Lacoste with a four nothing lead starts Parker out and he misses ball one. This has not been a good night for Pete Rose thus far but Tim he had a good day Saturday didn't he. <laughs> he certainly did. As bet twice. Of course, he has part ownership in, of course, winning the Belmont. Here is the shortstop, Mac Williams, to Clark, and there's one down. How did Pete Rose find out about Bet Twice winning by 10 lengths? Now let's go back and recapture it. 
Well, first of all, uh, first of all, Saturday we had a late game and uh, we batted in the eighth inning and we were leading five to one, so we had to get them out in the ninth and it was about 5:32. I think post time for the Belmont was 5:33. So Perez went up the steps and watched the race, uh, and he come back about 5:35 or something like that, and he said he won by 10. I said, who won by 10? He said, but twice. <laughs> so I knew I was a winner right there. So I knew we couldn't lose the game then. He doesn't even know how much money he's got coming. <laughs> I'd be knowing, wouldn't you, if I had won something like that? Yeah, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> one strike now to Buddy Bell with one down. And that'll even it up with one and one. That money would have been a little more important to you and me. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. <laughs> Buddy Bell hitting 295, and he's going to ground that one back to Lacoste. And Lacoste has two up and two down very quickly. Boy, he's sailing through things right now. Score that one one to three, and that'll bring out Nick Osaski. And I guess you could say he's sailing with his sinker. There's that stat you're talking about. How effective he's been and how he has faded in the past. Last year, he was nine and three at the All-Star break, and then one and ten after that. Hard to believe, isn't it? Osaski, ground ball foul, third base side. Lacoste really over the years has been his own worst enemy. He gets upset easily, lets things bother him. As a result, he's lost some concentration, become a thrower, not a pitcher. But now they four-run lead. Excellent position. The Sasky's been red hot. He had a six-game streak where he's hitting 522 and has moved his average up. Now the count goes to one and one on Sasky. Hit his sixth home run yesterday. Four nothing, San Francisco. We're in the bottom of the second. Fly ball, right field. Aldonado will come in. He's got this one gauged and puts it away very easily. And it's an easy inning once again for Lacoste. Three up and three down. The Giants with a four to nothing lead. As the Reds thus far have not been able to solve Lacoste at all. Candy Maldonado's had eight game-winning RBIs that ties him for the National League lead, and he enjoys hitting in the clutch. It's something that, uh, as a player, and uh, when I was a little kid, it was the type of situation where you always want to come up and be the big hero or, or come up with a big hit. It's like uh, you say the production is the name of the game, and you always want to be on the top of that type of uh, category in the league. And uh, I have to thank my teammates because they made it possible. They were once getting on base and, and doing the job easier for us. Candy having the best year ever in the big leagues. He's tied with Parker and Tim Wallach with eight game winning RBIs. One strike on him. He had to back out of there. that little foul he hit. Must have hit him. He was kind of walking around shaking it off his foot I think. One strike and he fouls it down and the count goes to two strikes. Here's a case Tim of a guy who was a really didn't get a lot of opportunity to play for the Dodgers traded over. For Alex Trevino, a pinch hitter a year ago, and now they can't get him out of right field. Well, there are a lot of young players who get typecast too early with one organization. He came over for and for Trevino, as you said. But when given the opportunity to play, he was much needed by the Giants. But given the opportunity to play, he took advantage of it. Impressive young guy. One and two the count now. Browning trailing four nothing after giving up four hits. And there's a fly ball left field, hustling back, going back as Daniels. It's off the wall. Going to second, Maldonado. He'll make the big turn, and he'll be there with a double. So Candy Maldonado, who had 16 doubles coming into this game, which was sixth in the National League, just smacked another one off that left field wall. And the crowd here on Tom Browning, as you can hear. That ball down and in, and Maldonado just smokes it. See that ball down and in? You don't have to have the extension that you do on the ball up and in. All you have to do is drop the bat head on it. If that pitch weren't easy to hit, they'd make tees higher. <laughs> I like that, that's Terry. A, that's, that's, a bad, good. that's a bad area to throw it in, <laughs> down and in. Nice piece of hitting by Maldonado. So he's down at second again. He's singled back in the second inning for he's two for two. And Davis, who singled and scored a run, has one ball, no strikes on him. 4-0, and the Giants threaten it again, and here's a high fly ball center field. Davis going back, going back. He's on the warning track, leaps up, and it's gone for a home run, a two-run home run for Davis. That ball 
was hit a long way left of the 404 foot sign and Davis has taken four home runs away knew he had no crack at that one not unless he had a ladder that's a screwball and boy Chili Davis drives it to Eric Davis now Eric had an idea about jumping but he figured that ball's just too high no sense expending this much energy so the Giants now with six runs on six hits that for Chili Davis his eighth home run of the year RBI's number 30 and 31 and they're up and throwing in the bullpen again as you might suspect Frank Williams is up throwing Browning with a pitch now to Melvin who's single drove in a run and scored a run back in the second inning Browning has not fooled anybody pitch misses and it's one and one Bill Burgess, who's the Reds general manager, is looking for another starter desperately. But everybody wants a Tracy Jones or Kurt Stillwell or a Cal Daniels, and that's just too much to give up. I pop up, second base side. Ron Oster will be there. And there's one out. Derisive cheer here in Riverfront Stadium. The Navy's a little restless with the team down six to nothing. Well, the one reason that Pete's left Tom in this long, he's got to get him straightened out. He won 20 games two years ago, the first rookie to win 20 games in the Major League since 1954, and has really never regained that form that he had a couple of years back. He was 14 and 13 last year. That was after a very slow start. He lost his first four starts last year, yep. then came on, and I think they're hoping that'll happen again. 1-0 the count now on Will Clark who grounded out to the first baseman the first time. 2-0. So Browning giving up the six runs on six hits and he's been hit hard in this inning. A two-run homer by Chili Davis. There's a swinging strike and the count goes to 2-1. That's the thing about baseball, Tim. It's what have you done for me last? Don't tell me you won 20 games two years ago. That's right. 27 year old left hander and he now falls behind three and one. Well you have to develop pitchers within your organization pitchers and players the Reds have developed players but not so much pitchers. Clark high pop up short right field Oster going back he has a gaze that ball was hit very high and Clark is out. Two down. So two pop ups to second and that'll bring up Matt Williams who walked. Back in the second inning. Well, you got to get some innings because the three-game series here, the Reds uh, 13 home games in 14 days, thus far four and two in this homestand. Two outs and a call strike on Williams. Saying in their own organization, the Reds do have Bill Landrum, who is down in Nashville now, the AAA affiliate. He's 2 and 0 down there. And if they call anyone up, it would be Landrum. Sometimes managers think that by sending a starting pitcher to the bullpen, that'll straighten him out. There's a high fly ball, left center field. Daniels going over. Davis, it's going to be Daniels making the catch. And they retire the side, but there's two runs on two hits. Nobody left. It's a six to nothing game as Tom Browning has struggled for Cincinnati. Well, a lot of runs being scored tonight, already six. And look at yesterday, Tim, 102 runs in seven games, wow. most in one day since 1977. The most dramatic game, of course, the Atlanta Braves coming from behind to beat the Padres 12 to 11 after the Padres were ahead 11 to 2. Pete Rose said he was watching the game, went home, and somebody told him the Padres lost, and he didn't believe it. <laughs> Leading things off, Bo Diaz, the catcher, and he takes a call strike. Mike Lacoste with a 6-0 lead as we go into the third. There's Al Rosen, the president and general manager of the Giants. Shut out yesterday by Houston and Nolan Ryan, who went seven strong innings. What about Al Rosen? He did a very good job building that Houston Astros club before going over to San Francisco. Must have followed that development a year ago when they won the National League West. On the other hand, Tom Haller, formerly the general manager of the Giants, has to be given at least some credit for developing the Giants. 
And after all, he's the one who made the Jeff Leonard trade, the Jeffrey Leonard trade. Three balls, a strike on Bo Diaz. I get Jeff and Jeffrey confused. He but wanted to be called Jeffrey last year. I call him Mr. Leonard. Is that all right? <laughs> There's Diaz with a walk. And that is the first base runner in the ball game now for Cincinnati. So nobody out, and that'll bring up Ron Oster, the second baseman. All right, next week. And you know what that means to White Gooden, the Mets against the Expos. I was up there earlier this year, Tim, with that new roof on. Very nice place, Montreal. I haven't been there yet, but we're looking forward to bringing you that game next Monday night. That's provided Gooden starts on Wednesday, and he probably will. Foul back by Ron Oster. Boy, he was impressive the other night. You said he had some wicked breaking stuff. He worked six and two thirds innings over the weekend against the Pirates. He was the winning pitcher on Friday night. And his curveball was consistently over the plate throughout the game. On deck is Terry Francona, so Tom Browning will not be pitching anymore. Ground ball second, Thompson. First base, double play. Boy, they turned that one quickly, and this team leads the major leagues in double plays. That's the 74th double play of this year by San Francisco. And you know what the amazing thing about that is, is because they haven't had Thompson for the full year. He's been on the DL. Jose Uribe, the regular shortstop, has been out. And on the DL three different times, he's out now. But young Matt Williams makes the pivot very, very well. I was talking to Harry Spillner, who is utility man for the Giants. And he said Matt Williams acts and plays as though in the field, that is. And he acts and plays as though he's been in the big leagues for a long, long time. And that bat will come around, they think, in time. He's just been pushed a little too fast, maybe. Terry Francona pinch hitting for Browning. Fouls one down the left field line. It'll go into the seats. So they're going to have to make a pitching change early. Williams continues to warm up for Cincinnati. Terry Francona very good at hitting to the opposite field guy whose career has really been stymied a lot by some bad knees. Number round the number one round draft choice of the Expos back in 1982 including Bill Gullickson the Reds have 10 number one draft choices on their roster. Francona Gullickson and eight that they've developed. Remarkable. Third of the ball club. Mm -hmm. 1-1 one, one now to Francona. The two out, ground ball, first base side, Will Clark. He'll go to Lacoste. And so they race him after the fine double play, the 74th of the year for San Francisco. And so the Reds still have not scored. They find themselves down 6 to nothing. ABC's Monday Night Baseball is being brought to you by Coors, the beer with a difference worth tasting. Coors is the one. Mike Lacoste, who has a 6 to nothing lead, will lead things off for the Giants as we go into the top of the fourth. And Frank Williams is the new pitcher for Cincinnati, side-arming right-hander, a former San Francisco Giant. He has no record. He's 0-0. His earned run average, 3.32. Been in 28 games previous to tonight. And he has one save. And there's a fly ball center field. And make that second base. And over there is Oster to make the grab. One down. That'll bring up the top of the order in Chris Spire. Williams, 38 innings pitched. He's given up 37 hits, 16 runs, 14 of them earned. He was acquired for Eddie Milner, who we may see before the night is over. Eddie coming up from Phoenix after a 21-day rehab down there. Gary, there were two other players obtained by the Reds in that deal. Mike Villa, a pitcher, and a guy named Timber Mead, T-I-M-B-E-R. Now, that guy's got to be a hitter. Timber Mead. What a great baseball name. <laughs> That'll be in your next book, I can oh, tell. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. One strike now on Spire. Spire reached on a fielder's choice, hopped up to the second baseman. Six nothing. San Francisco, there's that side arming motion. Well, you've got Gullickson, you've got Ted Power, and who else? Mario Soto is home in the Dominican Republic. He's going to rest until the All Star game, then have a re examination in Cincinnati. Should uh, 
you have to have surgery, they may have to go that route. So Browning's performance tonight, not very encouraging to Pete Rose in Cincinnati as they look for that next starter. There's fire, fly ball, right field. Dave Parker, Hessling over there, it's going to go to the wall. Parker plays it off the wall. Spire digging for second, and he's in there with a double. So Chris Spire just having a superb year, hitting 274 coming into this game with a double. How about that? Frank Williams went through the entire 1986 season without allowing an extra base hit to a right-handed batter. And here Chris Spire doubles off of it. Well, he was very effective with the Giants last year, a 3 and 1 record, a 1.20 earned run average. And now Bo Diaz wants to talk to him. Robbie Thompson up, 1 for 2, a single and an RBI. Los Angeles leading Atlanta 2 0 in the fifth. Well, San Diego not scoring the runs today as they're deadlocked with Houston. Montreal, they've been a surprise, Tim. They, they really, really played well. I was talking to Terry Francona before the game. As you see, the St. Louis score, too. He said Buck Rogers was a very underrated manager. Rounded foul, third base side by Thompson. And that was said by a youngster who didn't play regularly. Usually, it's the extra men who complain about managers and give them bad names, but Terry wasn't a regular up there. And if an extra man can say that about a manager, you know he's doing a good job. And Buck Rogers certainly is. One strike on Thompson, and this one misses and goes one and one. Well, the Expos getting great play out of Galarago, the first baseman. Tim Wallach is back and healthy. Hubie Brooks is back at short. Casey Candell has been a real fine for him. And that, of course, will be our game Monday night, the Expos and Mets. Get a look at them first half. One and one with one down and a runner at second. Thompson had an ocean, held up, and it misses, and the count goes to two and one. Robbie Thompson is one of those scrappy guys at second base. Hit 271 last year, and that's what he came into tonight with, an average of 271. Turns the double play very well. He came out of Class A ball right into the major leagues. There's a call strike, and the count evens at two and two. And when he came to the major leagues, as you look at Williams, he came up, and Don Zimmer, the third base coach's son, received a $5,000 bonus for signing Robbie Thompson. And Don Zimmer, remember, was the guy who recommended Chris Spire to the Giants. I'm not surprised. I think Don Zimmer has seen it all. Down at the third base coaching box. 3-2 now. Full count on Thompson. There he is, Popeye. He was putting on quite a show before the game. He's talking about the win in Candlestick Park. Having a tough time keeping his hat on. <laughs> he was also telling some marvelous Johnny Padre stories. 3-2 and he got him. Thompson goes down swinging. Really a hanging slider right here, but watch the front side of Robbie Thompson. When that front side opens up too soon, that's what happens. So that's going to bring up Jeffrey Leonard, who has popped up and grounded out his first two times. Williams in relief of Browning, who went three innings, giving up six hits, six runs. All of them earned. Walked one and didn't strike out anybody. And Williams now delivers to Leonard. That ball hit deep to center field. Going back, Davis. He's on the warning track, and he's got it. Leonard gave that one a long ride. No runs on one hit, no errors, and one left. We go to the bottom of the fourth, 6-0, San Francisco. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. The Padres and the Astros at the Astrodome. Top of the second inning, it's a scoreless game, and Luis Salazar takes Bob Nepper deep back to left field over the 378 sign. It is gone for Salazar, his 12th home run of the year, as the Padres lead the Astros 1-0, bottom of the second inning. Riverfront and this guy I'm sure everyone recognizes the president and general manager of the San Francisco Giants Al Rosen and Al we got you six to nothing lead you're gonna have to come up here more often Gary when you told me to come up here about the third inning I was wondering would we be ahead or behind now that we're ahead I think anytime you want me to come up I will all right we're glad to have you up here as we start this bottom half of the fourth the top of the order now up for Cincinnati Cal Daniels swings on the first pitch fly ball left field curving and that ball is a foul ball Boy, not by much. 
He gave that a long ride to the opposite field. Al, we were just talking at the start of this game. What a job you and Roger Craig and the Giants are doing. With all the injuries, all the problems you have, you're right in the thick of everything. We're very fortunate. We've got some players who have come through very well for us. Young Matt Williams was playing college ball last year at this time, and he's done a remarkable job out at shortstop, playing in the middle of the diamond. You know, uh, it's, it's rather easy sometimes to play on the wings. But uh, when you're playing right in the middle, you know how that is, Tim. And uh, he has to, he's sort of the, the focal point of the infield out there. Chris Fire has just done a, an outstanding job. I don't know where we'd be without him. There's a 1-1 pitch to Daniels. Misses and the count goes to 2-1. and one. Well, we were talking about that. You listened to your people. Don Zimmer recommended him, didn't he? That's right. When uh, Don came over to us, he talked about him and... Listen, those fellas out on the field know more about it than I do, so I, I don't mind listening. Well, you played that third base position as well as anybody. Three and one. Kruko going on the DL. That's just another uh, chapter, I guess, to the injury problems. Well, we're not very happy about it because last year, as you know, he was a 20-game winner, and our stopper, he was a fellow that you'd always wanted to start a, a series off with because you figure you had a pretty good chance of getting off to a good start. He'll be out for 15 days, and I hope he can correct himself. He's had some problems and uh, hadn't pitched as well as we'd like him to. 3-1 to Daniels, and that's hit up the middle for a base hit. So Cal Daniels starts things off here in the bottom of the fourth. And that is the first base hit of this ball game for Cincinnati, and Barry Larkin will come up. Well, you activated Eddie Milner. That's an interesting story, Al, his battle back. It really is. Uh, he's done a good job uh, getting himself back into proper perspective and viewing life the way it should be and uh, facing up to his problems and getting rid of them. And uh, he's a valuable asset to a ball club because he lends so much. He can run. He's an outstanding fielder. He's got a good bat with some pop in it. We're just delighted to have him back, and I know that he is, too. I talked to him today. I flew up with him from Phoenix, and we had a long talk about all the things that he went through, and uh, he's ready to put that episode in his life behind him and go on with a new start. One strike now to Barry Larkin. Larkin grounded out the first time. 6-0. The Reds with their first hit of the ball game, represented by Cal Daniels down at first base. Mike Lacoste, the right-hander, looking for his seventh win. Lacoste has been a little bit of a surprise, hasn't he, Al? By he most pitched very people. well last year, if you remember, Gary, in the first half. He was 9-3 and three at the All-Star break, and then after the All-Star break, he lost three tough ball games by one run, and then all of a sudden he got hit, hammered a couple of times, and just went downhill from there. But Buffy knows what he's doing out there, and he's a great competitor. He, he wants the ball, and he'll keep us in the ball game. There's a strike call, and the count goes to 0-2. Now, you were instrumental in getting Mike Lacoste with the Houston Astros, and then uh, when you went to San Francisco, you got Lacoste over in San Francisco. That happens often, does it not? It sure does. You, get, you have an affinity for a player, and Mike Lacoste is one of those people that I always felt was going to be a late bloomer, and uh, he's proven that... High fly ball, center field. Coming in is Chili Davis. Had a little trouble with it there for a moment, but he's got it now. And there's one out. You know, he was a, uh, he's a big, long, tall, gangly sort of a fellow, and uh, it was just it took him time to get all that coordination, Tim. You've seen a lot of pitchers like that. And uh, at this point, he, he gets a fastball up there over 90, and he's got a good split finger, and he's got a good breaking ball. And as I said prior to this, he was very, very competitive. The other fellow that I brought over was Harry Spillman. I think wherever I go, I'm going to have to have Harry Spillman with me. <laughs> well, he's a good left-handed pitch hitter. What about this guy, Eric Davis, Al? Does he remind you of anybody? Yes, he reminds me of a fellow ought to be in another league. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> but he is uh, he's just absolutely outstanding. He's an electrifying player, and he's someone that uh, people will pay to see. He'll put some great numbers on the board, and I hope he has a long, great career because baseball needs that kind of talent. He was called out on strikes back in the first inning, and it's now one ball, no strikes. His bat speed is what everybody talks about. He's wearing the same number as Henry Aaron. Does that also remind you of the way he whips a bat around? Well, he could really get it through the strike zone, too. I think both of them have a lot in common. Uh, uh, this fellow has more speed. There's the runner going. Daniels, the throw is down there, and he's in there safely. Daniels 13 of 15 this year in the stolen base department. And he's in at second now successfully. And Al, you're talking about speed. When you were playing for the Cleveland Indians in the mid-50s, a team down six runs, there would be no thought of stealing absolutely second Absolutely not. Base. No, absolutely not. I, the game has changed to that, uh, from that perspective. Players do have great speed. It's, uh, uh, you look for legs when you're out scouting. 
And but uh, a play like that, it, he was safe, and so obviously it's a good play. But if you've been thrown out with this fellow hitting, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense to him. Two and zero now on Eric Davis, a runner at second with one down inside. Well, the Reds, Al, have been successful in 81 percent of their stolen base attempts. Well, they do have good speed, but uh, I just I really don't. <laughs> I don't think the, the percentages are there. I think because that one time that you get thrown out, you may take your club right out of an inning. Not but with Bob Melvin catching. I mean, <laughs> he's right. got an excellent yeah. arm, one of the finest throwing arms in the National League. There's the strike, well, and they're looking goes to the three and one on that, uh, Timmy. I think that they realize that he doesn't get that quick delivery to the plate, and uh, he took advantage of it. More power to him. I hope he keeps trying to do it. Three and one now to Eric Davis. Daniels down at second. Six nothing, San Francisco, but. The first runner in scoring position for Cincinnati. Davis will back out of there. Al, you mentioned scouting. Is that the first thing that you think about when you try to build an organization back into respectability? You certainly want legs. Are you talking scouting, about scouting? Oh, just a absolutely. Scouting system. There is no doubt about it. You just really need good scouts. If you don't have good scouts, Timmy, you just got to pack it in. The clubs that have good scouting systems and good minor league systems with instructors and things like that are the clubs that are competitive year after year. Do you think the minor league systems or the strong minor league systems are more of a thing of the past because of free agency and the players changing club? I, th I think it's more difficult to get outstanding prospects at each level. I think the prospects are becoming fewer and fewer as you see them when you're out scouting free agents. I think as you develop them and train them through instructors and coaches in the minor league system you're able to bring them forward a great deal but in the old days when it was free scouting before the draft you saw a great many more uh, good athletes here's Dave Parker fly ball left field coming in as Leonard he'll put it away for the second out as the class get in a little trouble now Davis walking that was the second walk he'd given up we have runners at first and second and two down I'm a bug on scouting and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned I think those fellows are the unsung heroes in the game uh, they very travel a great job. Isn't it? Oh boy, they're by themselves. They travel. Uh, they have to make all their own arrangements, and they go to all these little towns and looking for players. And uh, uh, they're to be commended because without a good scouting staff, as I said before, you can just pack it in. Two out now. Daniel still in scoring position at second. Buddy Bell is up. He grounded out. Pitcher to first. Lacoste starts him out with a strike. What's the story, Al, on Chris Brown? When do you expect him back? Well, he's been hitting and taking ground balls. They're going to take the wires off uh, this Friday. And uh, he tells us he's going to be ready to play over the weekend. I'm not sure. There's that split finger fastball. On the way, all one pitch, and Bell with a big rip. He foul tipped it, and the count goes to two strikes. We really need that fellow in the lineup because not only is he a fine defensive player, but offensively, he's a tough out. And he's a fellow that knocks in big runs for you. Al, I've, I have been asked a lot of times, and I'm going to ask you, do you think you would have been as an efficient a hitter as you were, and you had a marvelous career, if they threw that split finger fastball with the frequency that they do it do now? Well, Timmy, that's, that's a supposition. I'm not sure that... Uh, <laughs> I can answer that with any degree of uh, truthfulness. Uh, I think I could have hit any any time, and they had pitches in those days that uh, uh, they used. Their, as a matter of fact, we saw a pitch uh, down in Houston. 0-2 pitch, grounded to short, headed into left field for the base set. Daniels rounding third. He'll score the first run of the game for Cincinnati. saw the Houston pitching staff use a, uh, a cut fastball quite a bit and they uh, it looks like Les Moss down there has taught those fellows how to throw an awfully good one and that's a pitch we used to see an awful lot the cut fastball which was more like the quick slider and this is the type of hit that you're like likely to see on the artificial surface yeah. too so the Reds now have something going they picked up a run on two hits still two runners on and that'll bring up Nick Kosaski the first baseman and he takes a strike well, one thing, I guess, Al, that uh, you know about the Reds, they're a great catch-up team, so there's a lot of baseball to be played in this one. This is one time when Yogi is really right. It's never over till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, Al, I was a big Cleveland Indian fan when you were playing third base all those years. That was, that was, I just want you to know it's exciting to have you up here and to have an opportunity to visit with you. Well, thank you, Gary. It's uh, nice for me to be up here, and uh, uh, 
I, I'm glad that you watched us back in those days because those were golden years in Cleveland and I certainly hope they they come back to that. Uh, they've got a fine young ball club over there and I just know they're off to a rough start but I think they'll get going before it's all over. One one pitch to a Sasky misses inside and the count goes to two and one. And now Melvin goes out to talk to Lacoste. You mentioned the Cleveland Indians and of course a former left hander a left hander that you had last year Steve Carlton obviously a good friend of mine. And uh, you thought he was a very classy guy. Didn't you? One of the finest men I'd ever met. You know, I hadn't had the pleasure of meeting Steve prior to his coming over, and I was just delighted to be around him. He, um, there's all. That's a classy guy right there too. That fellow named Craig. He certainly is. Uh, but uh, Steve just did a. He was terrific when he came in. When we had to tell him that we thought we'd have to make a change, he accepted that. The gentleman that he is, and I'm delighted he's he's caught on. I see he won last night. He won yesterday yeah. afternoon. That's yeah. right. As Cleveland beat Oakland. Yeah, that's great. Well, he's four and four now in the year. I saw him pitch in Fenway a week ago, and he doesn't like to pitch there. Those left-handers. <laughs> Not too many lefties <laughs> no. do. Right. All right. The conference is over. Craig made a visit to the mound. Lacoste two-one pitch with two down. Call strike, and it's two and two. There was one left-hander that made a living pitching there. He didn't win as much on the road as he did in Fenway, and that was Mel Parnell. Yep. Well, he's one of the few, though, right, That's Al? Right. You got to look long and hard. Bill Lee won 17 games four years in a row in that ballpark. Well, people say they don't know where he didn't know where he was a lot of times, though, right? <laughs> he didn't think he was in Fenway. <laughs> There's a steal attempt at third, and Davis is in there. Wow. That's his 26th stolen base, and he'll take third with anybody. Well, if it was a chance for Cal Daniels to steal second, six runs behind. It's even more of a chance for Eric Davis to steal third with two outs, five runs behind. But Davis has shown that he will run on anybody. And now with the count, three, two, two out, Bell will be going for third. Full count. Or for first, pardon me. Now at first, they're not holding him on. Davis the lead at third. 26 stolen bases now for Eric Davis. Outside, he walking. It's loaded up third walk of the game that by the way is the 18th consecutive stolen base for Eric Davis he's only been caught twice this year the major league record for consecutive steals held by Davey Lopes he stole 38 in a row for the Dodgers back in 75 activity now Murphy the left-hander Rob Murphy starting to heat up for Cincinnati San Francisco still doesn't have anybody up and throwing as Lacoste now the 6-1 lead. The base is loaded and two down. Bo Diaz, who walked back in the third inning, is up. Chance for the Reds and their patented come from behind bid to do some damage. They are tough come from behind. And there's a pitch missing. And the count goes to one ball, no strikes. Started a base hit by Daniels. A fly out. There's a pitch and it's 2 0. And a walk. A fly out. A single and another walk. Now Jeff Robinson is up and throwing for San Francisco. They're excellent right handed reliever. This is a hitter's delight, isn't it, Timmy? I'm base is loaded. You. Two outs, 2 0. Oh, Diaz. 2 0 pitch. Strike call. Boy, this National League West is something. Six games separating the top five teams in the division. Last year, these two teams were nine and nine. Pitch to Diaz, strike two, swinging. Two and two. There's Jeff Robinson. Been very effective for the San Francisco team. Norm Sherry, the pitching coach. There's Roger Craig. He's done a fantastic job for our ball club, Gary. He's just been quite a guy. Very positive guy, isn't he? Yes, he is. Here we go. Two out. Bases loaded. 2-2 two -two to Bo Diaz. 6-1 San Francisco. Rounded. Shortstop Williams for the force, and they get out of it. So in the inning, they pick up one run on two hits. No errors. Three left. We'll return to ABC's Monday Night Baseball after this message and news headlines from our local stations.
Gary Bender, Tim McCarver, and the president and general manager of the Giants, Al Rosen. Al, you got him out of that bases loaded jam, so we're going to let you go now. I tell you, I thought I was pretty calm through that. You did very well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, both of you. Yeah, thanks, Al. Real pleasure to have you up here class guy and just great for baseball and we just enjoy having him up here 6-1 now the Giants really dodging some real difficulty giving up one run but it could have been a lot more as Frank Williams continues now on the mound for Cincinnati Candy Maldonado will lead it off he is singled and doubled he is two for two in this ball game. he scored a run so Maldonado's average continues to move up it was 335 at the start of the night Top half of the fifth here in Riverfront, and the pitch goes outside, and the count goes to one and one. Coming up later tonight, Monday Sports Night, host Al Troutwick, joined by heavyweight boxers Michael Spinks and Jerry Cooney. Also Jesse Jackson and Boston's Don Baylor. How about that Michael Spinks Cooney fight? Are you a fight fan, Tim? Indeed I am. Tell you what, 15th in Atlantic City. Very interesting. If he can keep away from Cooney's knockout punch, Spinks, great condition fighter. 3 1 now on Maldonado, Chili Davis to follow, and then Bob Melvin. Foul back, and the count goes full to 3 and 2. Tell you right now, though, it's all elementary when you think of Mike Tyson. He's number one, and everybody else is number, number two. Or number three, there is no number two. I don't think anybody wants to be number two. I don't either. I don't either. You know, the interesting thing about Spinks is that guy Shillstone is the one that worked with Will Clark in the offseason to get him back to a better conditioned state. He works with Spinks and he has done very well. There's a foul ball straight back and the count stays full. So Will Clark, who had, had all the injury problems a year ago, went on that diet and that intense conditioning program to help him and it certainly helps Spinks. He's put on weight become the heavyweight and a very very fine fighter. Full count to Maldonado. He struck him out. That's the first time that Frank Williams has come up over the top. Occasionally he'll do that. He threw that ball and he was on top of the fastball. And Maldonado looked stunned. You could see how far behind that fastball he was. Hitters like that. They like pitchers that come from the same area all the time. And when a pitcher like Williams gets on top of the ball after throwing all side on, it can confuse a hitter and appeared to confuse Maldonado then. Jelly Davis now turns around to bat left-handed against Williams. And he hits the first ball to right center field. It's going to be Davis over there, and he'll put it away for two out. That'll bring up Bob Melvin. Melvin singled and popped up thus far. Drove in a run and scored a run back in the second inning. Bob Melvin has really produced the long ball. He can hit the ball as far as anybody. 6'4", 205 pounder. He had no chance really to play in Detroit because he at that time was behind Lance Parrish. And he goes for an outside pitch for strike one. Roger Craig had coached five years with Sparky Anderson in Detroit. And he insisted that Melvin be part of an 85 trade in October that also sent Matt Noakes to Detroit. Noakes, by the way, is having a great year. He might be the all-star catcher in the American League. He had two home runs yesterday and now has 11. One and one to Melvin. Played collegiately at the University of California. And that one will go to the backstop. And the count goes to two balls and a strike. Frank Williams from Lewiston, Idaho. Went to Kirkland Washington High School there and then later to Lewis Clark State. In relief of Tom Browning. 2-1. All strike two and it's two and two. The thing that's impressive Tim about Cincinnati is that you got a guy like William sidearm then they'll bring in a left hander the next time. Rose really gives you a different look when he brings that bullpen in. Their bullpen, certainly their strength. There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, the starting pitching for the Reds has an ERA over five. And their bullpen has an ERA of about two and a half. There's only been three complete games this year. And he walked in. 
So Melvin will go down to first base with one, two out, and that's going to bring up Will Clark, who has grounded out unassisted to first and popped up to the second baseman. You talked to Al Rosen about his need for pitchers. We've also chronicled Pete Rose's need for pitchers. Everybody in the National League, every team, with the exception, possibly, of Los Angeles and Houston, all of them need starting pitchers. So where do you go to get them? You can't go from the, the teams. Where you do is you give up a Cal Daniels or a Kurt Stillwell, and that's expensive. And that's what's been dangled out there. And if they know you need it, they hold you up. Oh, yeah. Well, Pete was telling us about he was trying to make a trade with the Tigers and Sparky Anderson. And every time he started to zero in, Sparky would change it. <laughs> oh, one pitch inside, and it's one and one. Well, the story was about two pitchers. It was about Frank Tanana, who was going well, and Pete inquired about Frank. He said, oh, no, no. And Sparky mentioned, he said, what about Don Dan Petrie? And Pete said, nope. And then Petrie started going well. And Pete said, I'll take Petrie. And Sparky said, what about Tanana? <laughs> little cat and mouse game, huh? <laughs> Two and one now on Will Clark. <laughs> There's Don Zimmer. He wants some company down there at third. But right now, his team has two outs and a runner at first. There's a ground ball to second. Oster comes up with it. That'll retire the side. No runs, no hits, no errors. One left. So San Francisco with a lead of six to one as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Welcome back to Riverfront Stadium. Gary Bender, Tim McCarver. Glad to have you with us as we go to the bottom of the fifth inning. Six one San Francisco. Ron Oster will lead off and we're going to have a pinch hitter for Frank Williams as Kurt Stillwell is in the on deck circle. Mike Lacoste has given up thus far one run on two hits. Oster, first ball hitting, second base. Robbie Thompson flies it down. Get it to hurry. He didn't get it. That'll be a base hit. The third base hit of the game now for Cincinnati. That'll bring up the man we mentioned, Stillwell, as a pinch hitter. And this is really the type of hit that the Giants got back in the seventh inning to set everything up. Kind of a bizarre inning. Two infield hits, a double at Tom Browning hit pitcher Mike Lacoste and they walked the 186 hitter so the Reds are hoping to get that type of inning started here in the fifth Stillwell hitting 288 coming into this game he's a switch hitter and the ball goes inside so Lacoste who was sailing along got out of a big jam in the last inning with the bases loaded Oster starts things off here in the bottom of the fifth with a base hit the Reds just keep battling and scrapping and scraping their way back into a game. Low, and it's 2-0. No. no lead is really safe with either of these ball clubs. Cincinnati, you mentioned earlier, has come back 17 out of the 32 games in which they've won. And they've come back three times from a six-run deficit. Stillwell in pinch-hitting situations is one of nine this year. That's a foul ball, and that made him skip down on the right field line. Williams, who will come out of the ball game in relief of Browning, went two innings, gave up one hit, no runs, no, let's see, two strikeouts and one base on balls. So Williams did an effective job in relief of Browning, who was shelled early for those six runs. Two and one now on Stillwell. Inside, and it's three and one. Kurt Stillwell, who just turned 22 years of age. Matter of fact, he was the youngest player in the National League last year for most of the season. June 4th with his birthday. 3-1 now. Runner at first, nobody out. Cal Daniels due up next. And that's a fair ball down the right field line. And going to the second with a stand-up double. Pitch hitting Kurt Stillwell. Osters at third. Of the things we mentioned the changes in the game one of the things that have also changed in baseball the maturity of the young players coming off the bench it used to be such that managers the only people they wanted on the bench were more experienced players not so anymore the game's certainly changing in that respect and the younger players are answering the call 
Jeff Robinson up throwing again. Jim God has joined him down that left field line for San Francisco. Cal Daniels now with runners at second and third. Four hits of the game now for Cincinnati. Single by Oster, a double by Stillwell, the pinch hitter, and Daniels, who was singled, scored a run, and flied out, is up. Bottom of the fifth inning. Larkin due up next now for the Reds. Just missed, and the count goes to 2-0. Well, if you like a lot of runs, just stick around, huh? Yesterday was a good example of that. Boy, these two teams have been scoring a lot of runs, as has Houston. Houston back to the 500 mark now in the National League West. I tell you, this is a dangerous situation. Cal Daniels just missed a home run, his second at bat. And were it not for a great play by Jeff Leonard, the left fielder, he would have had at least to double his first time up. 2-0 pitch, Daniels grounded, second base, Thompson's there, a run will score, he gets the runner at first. So Oster is home. RBI for Daniels, hitting the ball to the right side of the infield, and now it's a 6-2 ball game. That was kind of a situation where both the pitcher and the hitter did about what they wanted to do. Naturally, Daniels would have preferred to get a base hit, but... Lacoste got the out, and Daniels drove in the run and moved the runner to third in the same breath. So they've cut the lead now to four, and that's going to bring up Barry Larkin, who's 0 for 2, grounded out and fly to center. Runner at third base, leading up is Stillwell. Ground ball to second, Thompson, a busy man, goes to first, and another run scored. So all of a sudden, it's six to three. Yeah, that's the advantage. If you're going to make an out, naturally, being down by five runs, you'd prefer to get a base hit. But with Daniels hitting, not only did he score the runner from third, but he moved still well to third, so he could score on the ground ball by Larkin. Just the little things in baseball. Yeah. Hitting that ball to yeah. the right side. Now the Reds are back in the ball game. There's Robinson, the right-hander. Two out. Two runs are in, six to three. Lacoste, who had a six to nothing lead, gave up a run in the fourth, and now he's given up two here in the fifth inning. Eric Davis struck out and walked. 1-0 pitch, swing and a miss. That's where you have to pitch him inside because of the way he dramatically goes down with that bat. Most hitters hitch is back. Eric Davis is down. 1-1 pitch to Davis. Big cut again. You know what? He's exciting when he misses. <laughs> when he fouls one back. He does not get cheated. Takes some rather healthy cuts. He's labeled E, or Mr. E, if you prefer. 25 years of age, and the split-finger fastball is going to be delivered now by Lacoste on a 1-2 count. Ground ball, headed left field, base hit. That's the third hit of the inning. Well, with two down, that'll bring up Dave Parker, who is 0 for 2. Made that look easy, didn't he? The great athletes do. That was that pitch inside that he had been missing. A matter of Lacoste going to the well once too often. Roger Craig's really in a dilemma right now. He would prefer that Lacoste finish this inning to get the win. On the other hand, he would prefer the team get the win. Yeah, that's a little <laughs> more important, isn't it? That's right. Dave Parker up. Parker had a home run yesterday, his 13th of the year. He has eight game-winning RBIs, tying with Wallach and Candy Maldonado. And you know what? Tomorrow is his birthday. He'll be 36 years old tomorrow. Here's what happened last year at the All-Star break. Schmidt, of course, is hurt this year. There's a drive deep center field. Forget it. Way, way out of here.
the Cobra, Dave Parker, 14th home run, two RBIs, giving him 40 and 41 for the season, and Roger Craig's going to make a change. Was there any doubt about that one? Well, there really wasn't. He just muscled that ball out of the ballpark. Roger Craig is going to make a double switch. Maybe Bob Brindley will come in as the catcher, or someone will replace Will Clark at first base, possibly Mike Aldretti. But with Lacoste due up second in the sixth inning, he is being taken out of the ball game with the lead with no chance to win this game. We'll return to ABC's Monday Night Baseball after this word from our local stations. Well, at Riverfront, the fireworks continuing. After trailing six to nothing, Cincinnati on four hits have scored four runs. They've cut it to one body. Bell is up. Ground ball to third. Chris Fire, the long throw to Mike Aldretti, who came in on that double switch, and they get out of the inning. But it's a big inning for Cincinnati. Four runs, four hits in the ball game. As now it's six five, San Francisco after five. So we're going to have the third pitcher of the ball game, Browning, Williams, and now Rob Murphy for Cincinnati. And you can see this will be his 27th appearance, three and one record. Hard throwing left-hander, Murphy, out of Miami, Florida, played collegiately at the University of Florida, will come in. His team now has cut the lead to one, six-five, as leading things off, Matt Williams for San Francisco. Way back when, in the third inning, it was a six to nothing game in favor of San Francisco. But the Reds have come back to score one in the fourth and four in the fifth. Williams swings through it, strike two. Williams has walked and fly to left. Jeff Robinson coming in and getting San Francisco out of that last inning. The big blow, the tremendous two run home run by Dave Parker. Two and one. Murphy sinking fastball has a hard slider excellent arm 27 years of age and this one fouled and the count goes to two and two number one draft choice in 1981 he is a computer programmer Tim and uh, he uses those computers to know what kind of horses to buy and I asked Pete Rose if he helped him with bet twice he said no there wasn't anything doing on that one wasn't familiar with that <laughs> twice. <laughs> His grandfather, Frank Ashley, called seven derbies, believe it or not. So he's in the horse business. There's a call, strike three. He's in the baseball business, too. Keep making pitches like that. You've heard of stiff armors in football. Well, Rob Murphy's a stiff armor in baseball. He throws with that stiff left arm, which I would think would be tough on the elbow, but it's also tough to pick up if you're a hitter. So Murphy strikes out Williams, and this is going to be Mike Aldretti up for the first time. Using that double switch, went to first, and Will Clark left when Robinson came in. Robinson batting in Clark's position, which is the seventh spot. Aldretti's got to be happy. He's a graduate of Stanford, and they won the College World Series yesterday. Beating Oklahoma City, or o Oklahoma State. Well, Oklahoma City's in the state of Oklahoma That's anyway, right? right? That's, That's right. what you meant. One ball, one strike. It's the difference between Oklahoma City and Stillwater, though. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. What do you think Aldretti's thinking right now? He says, I can't start against a right-hander, but now I'm in there against a nasty left-hander and Rob Murphy. Well, he's been hitting well. He's 338 for the year. Count goes now to two and one. Thus far, eight RBIs, and this is his 81st time at the plate. And Aldretti, the left-handed batter, with one down here in the top of the sixth. Foul back. Two and two. There are 
are those in baseball who talk about a middle inning reliever getting a hold. And Frank Williams, if that were the case, would be credited with a hold because he held the Giants scoreless for the two innings of work that he had tonight. 2-2 two -two pitch to Aldretti, and he let it go by very close. Full count now, 3-2. That's especially important, Gary, with a team like the Cincinnati Reds who can come back from big deficits to score a run. So middle inning relief for Cincinnati is more important than it is for other clubs. 3-2 pitch, fly ball, left center field. Davis and Daniels are there, and Davis calls him off and makes the catch. Two down. That'll bring up the top of the order, Chris Fire. Chris thus far has popped up, reached on a fielder's choice, and singled in the, doubled, I should say, in the fourth inning. His wife, Alita, is expecting next month, and he'll have a family of six at that time. Going to have his own infield. Delightful family. And a battery to go along with it. <laughs> One ball to Chris Spire. Chris was hired to be a utility man and he's become a starter due to all the injuries. There's a strike and it's one and one. Heard Al Rosen talk about Chris Brown. They'll be glad to have him back. Jose Uribe, I don't know about him. He's been on the DL three different times. They have just been plagued by one injury after another. One one pitch, excuse me, swing down to first. Sasky will go down and retire the side. They retire the side in order. Very quietly, the Giants go. 6-5, the Giants, the Reds, trying to erase more of that. ABC's Monday Night Baseball is being brought to you by Budweiser. Beachwood age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. We go now to the bottom of the six. Nick Osaski leading off. He'll be followed by Bo Diaz and Ron Oster. Sasky is walked and flied out to right. Sasky starting late this year due to the broken wrist he suffered in the Grapefruit League has started to come on. A home run yesterday is sixth. He said it's been an awesome feeling to get that swing back and to have the confidence. 0 2 pitch and he goes down swinging here. One down and that brings up Bo Diaz. It's kind of a good morning, good afternoon, and good night for Asaski. The breaking ball, then the fastball, and this breaking ball on the outside corner. Diaz is up. He's walked and reached on. Actually, came up the last time with the bases loaded. Rounded out. Ground ball, and that's going to make it through for the base hit. So the hits now are even at seven. As Bo Diaz with one down is at first and Oster will come up. He's singled and hit into a double play. Oster is one of those guys in the estimation of Pete Rose is invaluable to this team. Turns the double play so well. He says as long as I'm here Ron Oster's going nowhere. Switch hitter adding this time from the left hand side. They're not holding Diaz on at first. Another one of those slow catchers, Tim. <laughs> Stay off the catchers. <laughs> first pitch to Oster, I'll, one and all. I'll tell you what Diaz will do. He will delay steal. And what you do when you do that, I think a hit and run would be in order if he does run here, however. But if you do that, you steal on the middle infielders, not the catcher. Winging strike and the count goes to one and one because what happens after every pitch when the catcher catches the ball the infielders drop their head and if a, an alert base runner can take advantage of that regardless of his speed then he could steal a base and that's the only way Bo will be able to steal a base. I'm glad you admitted that. Oh run. yeah. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> one out one one pitch grounded second Thompson got it gets up throws and gets him. Nice play by Robbie Thompson. Oh boy was it ever. Two down, advancing to second on the fielder's choice, Bo Diaz. Watch his full extension by second baseman Robbie Thompson. Oh, 
a fine, fine play. A lot of second basemen would never be in a position to make that play because they'd be cheating towards second base for the double play. But Thompson somehow got a good jump on that ball and made the fine play as Tracy Jones will now be the pinch hitter for Rob Murphy. So he's really using his bullpen as Tracy Jones will come in. The last time we were here, Jones came in and hit a pinch hit home run a week ago tonight against St. Louis. So Jones is the guy who's been sharing left field with Cal Daniels. What a luxury they have being able to use those two guys. 26 year old right handed hitter on a Loyola Marymount and now with a 6 5 score the time run in second base and Bo Diaz with two out. So Jones could help this ball club as he's done most of the year done very well in a pinch hitting role. He had an ocean breaking ball misses and it's one and oh. Ron Robinson now up and throwing. He would be the fourth pitcher of the night for Cincinnati. So I guess Mrs. Robinson would be proud. We could have a Robinson versus Robinson in this ball game. All right. I hope I can handle it. <laughs> Cal Daniels on deck. If he could get to the plate as Tracy Jones swings through that one and the count goes to one and one. Jones, big man, weighs 220 pounds. He's another one of those number one draft picks. 1983. Diaz with his lead at second. Robinson's pitch misses and the count goes to two and one. Jeff Robinson making his 29th appearance. He was second in the National League in appearances coming into this game. His first major league save was by the Blues 200th major league win. Boy you do your homework you know that. 2-1 territory. Ground ball. Matt Williams the throw and they got him out ready with a nice stretch. So there's no runs on one hit, no errors and one left. So the Giants still lead it by one, six to five. Battle for the top spot in the American League East. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. Fifth inning, Jays and Yankees. And you talk about a Ruthian cloud. Watch this. Fred McGriff with a runner aboard mashes this Rick Roden fastball. It's sailing to the middle of the upper deck. McGriff, his fourth homer of the year. Jays scores seven times in the fifth. Now 8 nothing. Bottom of the fifth. Jays over the end. So Toronto who last year got off to such a slow start this year not the case. Well the Reds have certainly gone to their bullpen. They've had Browning starting Williams in relief Murphy and now Ron Robinson. Robinson with a one and two record of three point four five earned run average. This is his twenty eighth appearance hard throwing right hander. And he starts Robbie Thompson out with a strike Thompson. One for threes single. Drove in a run in the second, struck out and popped out. Made some very good defensive plays at second. Lifted his average 10 points on the one for three. Slow breaking pitch in the count. Now goes to 0-2. And, and the Reds anticipating their bullpen doing a fine job, and they have certainly once again got a lot of help from their bullpenners. Let me ask you something. You brought up something that was a new term to me. You talked about the fact that Williams would get a hole. It's not a statistic you see in the scorebook, but it's an interesting stat. Uh huh. One two pitch and it's even a two and two. There, there are a lot of people who think that middle relievers should be given more credit. For instance tonight if you look at the box score tomorrow morning you'll see Frank Williams two scoreless innings Rob Murphy one scoreless innings but no credit for it. That one's fouled back. If you take your con in for a contract renegotiation next year, how do you determine and how do you convince your employer that you did a good job on a night like tonight? Well, the way to do that was that if you gave up no runs in your middle relief stint, you get credit for a hole because you've held the opposition to no runs. If, on the other hand, you gave up runs to lengthen the lead, you will be penalized with a squander. 
No wonder there's agents and lawyers representing everyone, right? You got to figure the holes as well as the saves. <laughs> There's a swinging strike three by Robbie Thompson. So Robinson comes in and strikes out the first man he faces. And that'll bring up Jeff Leonard, who's 0 for 3. And it was ball four as Robbie Thompson swings at the eye high heat. When you're throwing that hard, you're going to go after a couple of those. Yeah, that's the pitch that's most appealing because that's where your eyes are. If your eyes were on your knees, you'd see the you'd see the low pitch better, right? <laughs> Jeffrey Leonard. One down here in the top of the seventh inning. Fly ball right field and it's going to go into the crowd. But often those middle relievers do give guys who finish games a chance to get a save. Leonard has dropped down to 345 at this time at the plate. Gwen really playing well. Guerrero, Maldonado, and Galarraga. That's a name that a lot of people probably don't know that well, but I saw him earlier in the year. What a fine first baseman he is for the Expos. There's a foul back. Two strikes now on Jeffrey Leonard. Matter of fact, we'll have a chance to see Andres Galarraga, the fine first baseman of the Expos next Monday night and also Dwight Gooden of the New York Mets to schedule the pitcher one down and two strikes on Jeffrey Leonard Aldonado is up next Ron Robinson and firing hard misses and the count goes to one and two so it's Ron Robinson against Jeff Robinson right now now their number one pick he was Number one pick and 80 bounced that one up to the plate. The count goes to two and two. Leonard this year has handed out hundreds of T-shirts that are very, very interesting. It says, "Life begins when drugs end." He knew he had made a mistake earlier in his life. He served his 100 hours of drug-related community service. So, shows you what kind of an impact he can have on youngsters throughout the country. And I'm sure Eddie Milner now coming up will stay very close to a guy like Leonard who's gone through some very similar difficulties. Milner, a former Red, activated today. And to reiterate, Mike Kruko, the fine pitcher of the San Francisco Giants, put on the disabled list with shoulder and elbow problems. 2-2 Two -two pitch, ground ball, Larkin will come up with it. Leonard hustles down first, and they get it. Two out. Maldonado, who has two base hits and a struck out, will come up. There's uh, Gwen. We're talking about how hot he's been. Look at that. Sizzling. High 77. Cruck, you know, he's a good hitter. He no, has also got a lot of walks. If you look, he's at the top of the league. And that's the other end of it. Maldonado has lifted his average to 339. How's it back? Looks like Diaz got that one off the helmet. Well, I tell you what, Tim. What is it you crouch behind that plate about 130, 150 times? And how many times do you get hit on an average game? Watch this. Well, that's the reason that catchers went from the soft hat or the regular baseball cap to that plastic helmet. And a lot of people think because the plastic or the helmet is plastic that it doesn't hurt. That's wrong. They think that a shot in the mask doesn't hurt. But what that ball does occasionally is really twist that mask around, jars the face. Maldonado, high pop up right side, and there's no play. Well, it's like a football helmet. You hit some guys, sometimes you hurt there too. It's a very similar situation. You saw that little extension on the mask of Bo Diaz. That's to protect the throat. And I can vouch for the fact that. I was hit in the neck muscle many times, but I was hitting the Adam's apple in this ballpark on a curveball in the dirt, and I did not have that extension there, and I spent three days in the hospital as a result. No wonder you're broadcasting today. I was huh? going to say, I couldn't talk to the delight of Vinny. I couldn't <laughs> talk for two weeks. <laughs> One and two on Maldonado. Was it Steve Yeager that developed that? Yeah, uh, that, he developed the flap. Yeah. The extension, in my opinion, is much better because there's more protection there. There are ways for a foul tip or a ball to come up and under to get under that flap, but not so that steel extension on the mask. One-two pitch to Maldonado, and Oster at second will make the play. 
And it's a very easy inning for Ron Robinson. So we've gone through six and a half innings. We'll return to ABC's Monday Night Baseball after this message and news headlines from our local stations. Back at Riverfront Stadium, Gary Bender, Tim McCarver, and our researcher Jerry Klein along with us. Eighth inning now. Los Angeles leading the Braves. San Diego, Houston deadlocked in the sixth. Montreal, we've talked about them. They're often moving tonight. Look at the runs being scored again. The Cardinals with 10 against Philadelphia. Philadelphia got back to the 500 mark. Cal Daniels will lead things off. We're in the bottom of the seventh here. 6 5 San Francisco. They led 6 0 earlier in this game. Jeff Robinson, the right hander, and his first pitch misses for ball one. Tim, if you look at this Cincinnati team, the wait here is this pitch by Robinson on the way. This is outside. A lot of people feel that they might be too young that when it gets down to the dog days of August, September, that some of their youth might make it a little tough for them. How I do you think believe, about that? No, I don't believe that. You got to go through it once. Everybody goes through it once. I think that's a that's something that's kind of been departmentalized in baseball to say because you're young and there's probably the greatest steadying influence on this ball club. Four straight pitches. Yes. I don't think Pete's going to allow this ball club to be like that. So Daniels is on the leadoff man the tying run at first and that brings up Barry Larkin who has an RBI on a ground ball. But he's 0 for 3 for the night. Wide out once, grounded out twice. Excuse me, Gary. The one thing that I've always thought about Pete, Pete has calm eyes. And regardless of the situation, and young players looking into those eyes, they figure if the man in charge is loose and relaxed, then I've got to be loose and relaxed. Roger Craig has a similar quality. Well, you said that today. We spent some time with Pete. He was very relaxed down in the clubhouse. And uh, it's amazing to me, as successful as he's been, He's been able to step away like that and assume that posture. Sometimes your good players are so intense they can't do the other. That's There's correct. a butt down the first baseline. Larkin will be tagged out by Aldretti and the sacrifice complete as Daniels moves to second base. So now the tying run in scoring position and that'll bring up Eric Davis. He single walked and struck out. Activity in the San Francisco bullpen. There's the bunt by Larkin. And not a bad bunt, but Aldretti entering the game in the middle of the game. You don't have to make a perfect bunt. He's not as warm or effective. He's actually an outfielder. Oh, good bunt by Larkin. Plus, you have Daniels, who's a fast runner. So on the artificial surface, you do not have to make as good a bunt with a guy like that running in the first baseman being Aldretti. One down now. Here is Davis. Runner at second and Cal Daniels. Jeff Robinson, the right-hander, trying to keep this game from being tied up. 6-5 San Francisco. Inside. New up next, Dave Parker at that tremendous home run the last time up. And the, left, shot. the left hander you, to whom you referred Keith Comstock is getting ready to face Parker. He just picked up his first win the other day he played in Japan a year ago. 1 0 to Davis. Strike call. One ball one strike. There he is the Cobra 14th home run of the year earlier tonight. 235th consecutive game in the starting lineup. Boy, he's throwing hard, but he's missing, and the count goes to two and one. Eric Davis coming in here with 55 RBIs, only two off the pace by Andre Dawson. is Davis the runner's going to tag Davis's throw coming to third Daniels will get there easily and here he comes Dave 
Parker. There you get an idea of why you can pitch Eric Davis inside. When he drops those hands, everybody talks about the fast hands, but what in effect he does, he slows his hands down. Because to hit it effectively, he's got to come back into the hitting area. That takes time, and that fastball was on top of it. So with two out and a runner at third, here comes Dave Parker. And here comes Roger Craig. So we mentioned Keith Comstock, the left-hander, has been warming up down the left field line. Let's see if they go to the left-hander. The face of left-handed hitting Dave Parker. Boy, this game looked like it was going to be all San Francisco. A six to nothing after three. Then the Reds come back to score a run in the fourth, four in the fifth. I think Rogers talking strategy there. I think what he's telling him is that normally we wouldn't walk a guy like Parker because he represents the go ahead run in the late innings. However if you're trying to pitch around him that's OK with me. And if you get two balls and no strikes we'll go ahead and walk him anyway. But make him hit a ball because I'd rather you pitch to Buddy Bell. I don't want to walk him but I'd rather have you pitch to Bell than Parker. Make him hit your pitch. Yep. Two down. You're liable to see Robinson come inside on Dave. Dave if he's vulnerable anywhere it's inside. Grounded foul. First base side and the count goes to one strike. Daniels down at third. He represents the tying run. There he is. The problem with the runner on third base and you try to pitch around the hitter, you're liable to throw a ball in the dirt and it gets by you and the runner scores to tie the game. There's a big difference pitching around the hitter with a runner at third as opposed to second. Popped up a mile high. Spire is locating it. He's in foul fair territory. He makes the catch and they get out of the jam. No runs, no hits. A man is left. We'll return to ABC's Monday Night Baseball after this word from our local station. Mr. Goodrich, that was GM. Well, we played seven at Riverfront. The Giants' eighth inning as Chili Davis up. He hit that tremendous home run back in the third inning, driving in two runs. He's walked and fly to center field as Ron Robinson has a strike. Chili Davis with his eighth home run a tremendous blast and right now the difference in this game with the Giants leading 6 5 one and one so right now it's up to the Robinson Ron and Jeff on deck is Bob Melvin and then would be Robinson in the position that he inherited from Will Clark. Would they make a change there or they just got to stay with a one run lead I would think continue with Jeff Robinson. They did have Comstock up and throwing in the last inning. 2 1 foul back. Let's go back to that tremendous home run by Chili Davis in the third inning. Tim there it is. It was a screwball on the outside corner and watch Eric Davis. He wants to jump and make one of those patented grabs of his he's done it four times this year but you can only jump so high two of those against Jack Clark 2 2 now to Chili Davis as he begins the eighth inning and that will be lined to left field for a base hit so Davis with his third hit of the game and that's going to bring up Melvin he's single walked and popped up Kelly Davis last year got off to such a great start then faded after the All-Star game. This guy got off to an outstanding start. We talked about the long ball he's provided. We're going to have a pinch runner. Kelly Davis going to come out of there. It's going to be Eddie Milner who they activated for today's game coming up from the Phoenix Firebirds. So he'll stay in and play the outfield. And with that in mind I don't think Melvin's going to be bunting. You've got the pitcher in the hole. However, now you've got it looks like Scott Garrels down. Garrels. So Melvin may be bunning. Prior to that, Robinson was on deck with nobody warming up. That's right. And now drawing a throw at first base is a pinch runner Milner. 6-5 San Francisco. Nobody out. One on. We're in the top of the eighth inning. Runner plus the move. Swinging strike. Melvin went after that one. I tell you, Diaz had a notion to go down 
down to first. To Sasky holding him on. Now there's Gurelt. Scott Gurelt has been a very effective man out of the bullpen for Roger Craig. One strike pitch, foul back, and the count goes to 0 and 2. Gurelt has 60 strikeouts which is eighth in the National League if they have to go to him. And Don Zimmer right now would like to get some insurance runs. Boy, he's been a battle-hardened vet. Twice he's been hit by pitch balls, hasn't he, in his career? And he was operated on for a nerve problem. In That's his neck, right? Nasty-looking scar. And this he neck. still has some numbness in his thumb of his left hand. And there was a pitch out. Nothing doing. About it, Eddie Milner reactivated against his old ball club. He had 18 stolen bases last year, and everybody in Cincinnati realizes he can fly. He was hitting 244 in Phoenix, didn't play all that much as they brought him along very slowly. And there's the throw to first, and now I got him. They picked him up. It appeared that Milner was headed to second, and the snap throw by Robinson, he looked like he was in there to me. Ooh. He looked like he was safe. Even though you gotta admire Robinson, a big, lanky guy with that quick a move. Most of the time, it takes him a long time to uncoil when they're that big. Melvin on a one-two pitch fouls it off. Boy, it's a tough way for Eddie to come back to the big leagues. Well, it? it is, but I thought his hand was in there. Take one more look at it. Did he dive too soon? I think you're right. I think he was in there. Fouled, and the count stays at one and two. It looked like the glove of Nick Kosaski came down on top of the yep. hand when the hand was on the bag. Charlie That's Williams, the first base umpire, calling it. That's another reason that first base is a left-handed thrower's, thrower's position, because with a left-handed first baseman, no question about it. Two pitch now to Melvin with one out, and the count evens to two and two. So Robinson picking off Milner after Davis at single. One out in the top of the eighth. Out straight back. Melvin really battling in there. That was hittable there. That was one of those hittable fastballs. Robinson's done a good job moving the ball in and out. That was a fat part of the plate fastball there started the wave here in Riverfront Stadium if you're wondering what the noise is in the background. 2-2 two -two pitch. Right three call. Two down and that'll bring up Robinson who will remain in the ball game. You mentioned the wave and the Reds are hoping it's a tidal wave and it will be a tidal wave that Ron Robinson can, can continue to make pitches like that. Fastball, a little wave of the bat. Bob Melvin, two outs. Well, the last runs that the Giants scored way back in the third inning. The relief for Williams, Murphy, and now Robinson's been effective. All one. Robinson batting from the right-hand side. So to continue, Matt Williams would be up next. Swing and a miss. One and one. Robinson, a fast worker, and he's just rearing back and throwing right now. One one pitch. Misses, and the count goes to two and one. Activity down that left field line again for the Giants. Two on pitch, by two. I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a statement. I don't know if it's correct, but I don't think the wave has any place in baseball. <laughs> I think in football, it's all right. Baseball, it's, uh, they're going to do it in tennis next. Two-two. Struck him out. Go after 
after that leadoff single, picking off the runner, he strikes out the remaining two batters. 6-5, the Giants will return to ABC's Monday Night Baseball after this word from our local station. This is Corey McFerrin in New York. The Padres and the Astros in Houston tonight. Bottom of the sixth inning, a 1-1 game. Kevin Bass against Andy Hawkins. Bass, a shot to the corner in right. Denny Walling coming around to score. This breaks open the 1-1 game, 2-1 Houston. They've just added two more runs. It's now 4-1 Houston. Looks like the Pods are headed for their 44th loss of the year. All right, Corey, thank you very much. Houston, four and a half games off the pace. Eddie Milner now has remained in the ball game after going in as a pinch runner for Chili Davis. He'll inherit center field as Buddy Bell will lead things off. So we go now to the Reds, half of the eighth inning. 6-5, San Francisco. The Giants with eight hits. The Reds with seven. Buddy Bell in this game. Grounded out, singled, and grounded out. And this one's fouled straight back. You got it, Tim? Negative. I'm tired of charging foul balls. <laughs> I take a left on them now. I tell you, I do not have anything to do with them. Do you have any residual problems for being a catcher? Are you kidding? How about my whole body? Could have fooled me. <laughs> one, one pitch, grounded foul, and boy, they really scorched the dugout that time. The Giants kind of jumping around. And two. I notice all your fingers are still in place. All There's, point the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I was fortunate. I had a lot of split fingers. Had a broken right hand in San Francisco, as a matter of fact, back in 1970. One two pitch to Bell, and it's low, and the count's even at two. First base, third base, guarding the line now as the leadoff man here in the eighth. The Giants protecting a one run lead. Activity. There's Franco on the left. The ace, that's Concepcion, who's warming up. He may go in defensively. Bell, fly ball, left center field, going back is Milner, and he's got it. Eddie Milner showing his speed, got to that ball, and there's one out. That'll bring up Nick Sasky. Sasky. 0 for 2, he's walked one time. Jeff Robinson, the type of pitcher that is easier to handle if his ball's down. A nice running catch by Eddie Milner after that inauspicious return to Riverfront. First time he gets on base, he gets picked off. I said that's a tough way to start it back in the major league. It certainly is. Pitch missing inside now. Ball one to Nick Asaski. 6-5 San Francisco. They led it 6-0 after three. The Reds have come back with one run in the fourth, four in the fifth. They had the bases loaded another time. And the Giants were able to get out of the jam. Cincinnati a two-game lead over the Giants in the National League West. Sasky big cut. The count goes to one and two. Going to be a dogfight, isn't it? The National League West. Yeah, I think, I think overnight... A lot of it has to do with some of the injuries to the East, but I think the National League West is a better division than the National League East. Robinson bounces that one up, and the count goes to two and two. Well, the start of the night, Cincinnati by two over the Giants. Houston four and a half back, Atlanta five, and then L.A. six. Reds winning two of three with the Dodgers. Roger Craig. Turned the team around last year. 21 more wins in the previous season. Just misses, and it's full now at three and two. Three balls, two strikes, one out. Three-two pitch from Jeff Robinson. High pop-up. Matt Williams, the shortstop, calls for it. And there's two out. Let's check what's going on in the America League now. Saw a while ago Toronto having a big night. They're still leading 8 0 in the seventh. Boston leading Baltimore. Kansas City trailing Minnesota. See where Saberhagen is going to miss a turn due to an ankle injury. Toronto, half game behind New York, the start of the night, so they could pull into first place. Two out as 
The batter now, Bo Diaz. He's single, walked, and he was the guy who grounded out with the bases full. Look back on that fourth inning when they could have really done some damage. Robinson, 1 0 pitch, and it's 2 0. Oster due up next. I'll tell you, it's a good time, speaking of the American League, for the Blue Jays to make a move because Ricky Henderson and Don Mattingly are both out for the Yankees. 2-0 pitch. And it's 3-0 now. Robinson with two down now falls behind Diaz. 3-0. This guy's always around the plate. He'd make you hit the ball, but right now is dropped behind 3-0. Eight saves already tied a year ago. And he walked it. That's the second walk given up by Jeff Robinson and a perplexed Roger Craig realizing that he's got two out, but he's got a tie and run at first base. Well, Francona has already been used. He's got Concepcion who's been hitting very well. Jones has been used. McClendon, the backup catcher. Pete has economized as much as he could with his pinch hitters. He still has three left. He's used four pitchers tonight. Two out, a runner, and Diaz, a tying run at first. Oster grounds it down to the dirt for a strike. And Gary, the thing about using all of those pitchers, usually for one pitcher comes one hitter, generally speaking. Pete has used three hitters tonight and four pitchers. Well, Franco continues to warm up the ace. Roger Craig is trying to get his infield set. He He's actually talking to Aldretti, the first baseman, to tell him to play behind Diaz, but not way behind him, tight behind him. Can't be any tighter than that. Ground ball, headed into right field for a base hit. Diaz makes the turn. He'll hold at second. As the throw comes back into Matt Williams, base hit for Ron Oster. So two on with two out. And now the hits are even at eight. And we're going to have a pinch runner. McClendon will come in to run for Diaz and will remain in as the catcher. Rob Thompson, who made a good play on Ron Oster's last at bat, can't get to this one. And Diaz has to stop at second base. But you remember, Roger Craig allowed Robinson to hit with two out and nobody on. And what he did, he economized with his pitchers. Because now, once O'Neill is announced, he's going to bring the left-hander in and make Pete Rose spin the left-handed hitting O'Neill. And it's going to be Keith Comstock once O'Neill is announced. Well, O'Neill is their best pinch hitter thus far. He's 5 of 15 this year. He won the game for him opening day, drove in the winning run. Hasn't played that much. In fact, he hadn't played in a week until he was in the game yesterday. That Bob Lillis down there, he looks like he's landing a plane on a carrier. <laughs> he's got guys running all over the place. There's Bob. He had both hands up. All he needs is a couple of flashlights. Bob is listening to the eye in the sky, Gordon McKenzie. And Gordon McKenzie, the eye in the sky for the Giants, is responsible for outfield alignment. Modern technology. <laughs> at its finest, right? <laughs> That's right. So here comes O'Neill. So McClendon running, even though he's a catcher, he can run well. He has played the outfield as well as the infield positions. I keep hating to pick on catchers, Tim, but he can run well. I don't take you, it personally, will I, you? Oh, no, no, I don't. I, I got over that a long time ago. <laughs> I, I'm really you know, kind of in a quandary as to why Keith Comstock is not in the game now, other than the fact that that he's got less experience than Jeff Robinson. Well, right now, it looks like a good move because Robinson's ahead of O'Neill, 0-2. Well, if that's the case, what's Comstock doing up? I leave that up to guys like you who played how many years in the big leagues? Yeah, but <laughs> a few, but it's a lot easier up here, I'll tell you. 0-2 <laughs> to O'Neill, two down. Two runners on, bottom of the eighth. 
The Reds trail by one. Robinson trying to get out of the jam. He struck him out. Clutch pitching that time by Robinson. No runs. Two hits. No errors. Two left. We've played eight. The Giants maintain their one-run lead. John Franco, the ace of the staff, 12 saves. Before tonight's game, we talked to the left-hander about how he prepares himself to come in in a relief role. Well, uh, you know, it depends on the situation. If, if it's the base, uh, run is on base, uh, I try to get ready real quick. But if they tell me I'm going to start the ninth inning, I'll just uh, go out, bottom of the eighth, get ready uh, as fast as I can, and then uh, just stay back and then wait for an out and then start throwing again. And uh, with two outs, I'll come walking in to the dugout. Uh, Joe Harvey, our trainer, will come up to me with a uh, ammonia capsule. I'll sniff the ammonia capsule. I'll walk out, you know, always in front of Pete, in front of the dugout. Walk out, never step on the lines, and just go out and pitch. And that's it from there. And he goes out and pitches very well, as he's just been superb thus far. We mentioned the 12 saves. He's also been able to win three. Earned run average. Excellent. Is and that all he does? It sounds like he practices witchcraft <laughs> before going in there. When he said that ammonium oh. capsule, that kind of got my attention. <laughs> one strike to Matt Williams, and it misses. The count goes to one and one. Never steps on the white lines. That's like the cracks in the sidewalk, right? You, you weren't superstitious, were you? No, I wasn't. I am now, but I wasn't then. <laughs> Williams 0 for 2. He's walked once, lied out, and struck out. So Franco will try to stop it here and hope somebody can get something done in the bottom of the ninth for Cincinnati. Lloyd McClendon stays in the ball game to catch. He went in as a pinch runner. They have to go to another catcher. It'd be Dave Concepcion, and that one goes to the backstop. And the count evens to 2 and 2. McClendon, quite a story. He's been used everywhere. First base, third base. He's been able to catch. He becomes very valuable since they moved to a 24-man roster. That's been the place, hasn't it, Tim, where they cut the third catcher. The first main team's carrying three catchers. That's right. That misses, and it's full now, three and two. Three balls, two strikes, nobody out. We're in the top of the ninth. Six-five, San Francisco. They've led all the way, but they one time led six to nothing. Williams, line shot, left field, base hit, headed into the corner. He'll make the turn, and he'll go in easily into second base with a stand-up double. That gives us time to remind you that later tonight, ABC Sports presents Monday Sports Night with Al Troutwig. He'll have Michael Spinks and Jerry Cooney on the show, L.A. Law's Corbin Burnson, Jesse Jackson, Boston's Don Baylor talk about affirmative action in baseball. All begins tonight, 12 o'clock midnight Eastern, 11 o'clock Central here on ABC. So a visit to the mound now by McClendon. That and show may be a little bit late the way this game's going. That's right. right. Buddy Bell and Barry Larkin are out there with McClendon and Franco, and one would presume they're talking about the rotation play where Bell would charge and Larkin goes to third. Aldretti probably bunning. That's a, Sas a Sasky in at first. Pardon me, Gary. Excuse me, Tim. Aldretti comes up. That was a ninth hit of the game by San Francisco. Franco and squares around a butt, and he misses. The count goes to 1-0. and oh. Sasky charging for first. Aldretti looks down to Don Zimmer at third base. An insurance run at second base for San Francisco with nobody out in the top of the ninth. Matt Williams leading off with a double. On a third base side, coming in as Bell, his play is to first, and the runner advances to third base. Nice sacrifice punt. But what the Reds did, they faked the rotation play, and Aldretti just bunted it hard. He got Bell to field the ball, and normally that's who you want to field the ball. In that case, Williams can walk to third base. Now you got to bring your infield in. So Williams at third. That'll bring up Chris Spire. Chris has doubled back in the fourth inning, grounded out, popped out, and then on a fielder's choice, a run scored. So Franco, very cognizant of Williams at third. One down. Remember, 
Craig loves to squeeze. And Spire is an excellent bunner. Nasaski creeping in at first base. Had a notion it's there for a strike. One strike on Chris Spire. The first base, or I, I beg your pardon, the first pitch, very important with a runner at third and less than two outs. Because now you can pitch out without running the count any deeper. One strike to count, and stepping off the rubber is Franco. Infield is in. Williams down at third. Looks at Don Zimmer, who's giving some signs to Spire. Tell Spire to step out. He wants to go through the routine again. Williams with good speed with his lead off of third. Goes one strike pits and it's outside and it's one and one. Williams made a break down that third baseline. Well, the one thing the runner on third wants to do in a squeeze situation is not break too soon. Because if he breaks too soon, that alerts the pitcher and gives him an opportunity to pitch out. Franco will check him. One one pitch. He tried to bunt it. They've got him trapped. He couldn't come up and hit it, but it and they trapped. Williams and McClendon is hurt. The catcher hurt himself making the tag on Matt Williams. Boy, that was almost too far outside on the pitch out. He couldn't get to it. Spire did all he could to make contact, could not, and Williams was hung up. Actually, that's a catcher's balk. Bo Diaz is out. It is. There's such a thing as a catcher's balk. Or not Diaz, but McClendon. And then when Lloyd goes and tries to make the tag on Williams, it looked like he sprained an ankle. Now remember, Diaz is gone, and Davey Concepcion would be the third catcher, and fortunately, he's the only guy left for Pete Rose. Boy, what if they'd used him as a pinch hitter? They did not, so Rose still can bring on the veteran. McClendon, just looking at it, how he got hurt, let's look at it again, Tim. He saw the pitch out, and a catcher's responsibility is to go as hard as he can and I think on making the tag and the little pirouette that he did, no, it's a knee problem. He just did a little spin move. It didn't look like it would be all that much of a problem for him. But McClendon being looked over now. So Pete Rose's team able to get the runner at third, second out, and still within one run to try to come up with something in the bottom of the ninth inning. Well, Pete Rose and his staff smell the pit, smell the squeeze, and because McClendon pitched out, they had Williams easily coming in from third base. Boy, if they can get him to finish the inning somehow, some yep. way, they're going to do it. He's put the shin guard back on. They're one out away from sending this into the bottom of the night. Well, it'll be interesting if the Reds tie it. If he is hurt and the Reds do tie it, what will happen in extra innings? No extra innings there today, no, however. Lee Smith coming in. They get up the win. Trio with the home run. Moreland. Keith Moreland starting to heat up. Look at this. Neil Heat. He was the guy that the Twins traded for Jeff Reardon. And Heat now is 8-2. That's looking like a better trade all the time. He was 7-15 and 15 last year with the Minnesota Twins. Hershiser and Los Angeles defeating Atlanta. Well, McClendon is going to take a couple of tosses back to Franco, see if he's ready. He looks like he'll continue into the game. So two out, big run is a race from third. Spire is still up there with a one and two count. Nothing Chris could do. That was absolutely the most optimum time to have a pitch out. He tried desperately to get some wood on the ball. two pitch. Oh, that goes the backstop. You wonder, Tim, and you look back on that. Zimmer had him step out of the box, went through the signs again, and it's sometimes a really a big tip-off that there's something up. Well, it is. In a situation like that, a, a third base coach wants you to look down there all the time on every pitch and not do anything out of the ordinary. When you step out and when he has to call you out, well, that could be a dead giveaway. Yeah, and I think they were very suspicious. Spire grounds it to short. Larkin's got to hurry. He's got it. And so they get out of the jam. And we're going to go to the bottom of the ninth inning. Cincinnati trailing by one.
We talked about the surprising Expos, Neil Heaton winning tonight, and that's our game a week from tonight. The Big O, Olympic Stadium in Montreal, the Expos against the Mets. Dwight Gooden slated to go in that game, and we hope you'll join us a week from tonight. As we have a new pitcher now for San Francisco, Scott Gereltz, six foot four, right-hander coming in. He has a lot of decisions. He's five and three, his 25th game, and he has 60 strikeouts. He is sixth, pardon me, sixth in the National League in strikeouts, and he's a reliever, a short reliever. Well, I tell you, Robinson, Jeff Robinson did a good job. Three and a third innings, two hits, no runs, struck out two and walked two. So Lacoste, who went four and two thirds, giving up all five of the runs. Robinson did not allow a run in a three and a third innings. As we come to the top of the order, the Reds down by one, bottom of the ninth. Cal Daniels to lead it off. Geraltz with those 60 strikeouts. Six foot four right hander, and here we go. This is outside. This guy's had control trouble in the past, but can he throw it? He's had a fastball timed at 97 miles per hour. He has a split finger fastball time. And he misses again. Harry Larkin up next, then Eric Davis. And now Robbie Thompson, the second baseman, goes in, tries to steady him up a little bit, settle him down. Field for the Giants. Milner now in center with Leonard in left. Maldonado in right. Aldretti is at first base, coming in early, replacing Will Clark on a double switch. Strike call. Two and one. Burrells out of Shreveport, Louisiana, a native of Buckley, Illinois. 85, he was their bullpen ace last year with 13. One strike, nobody out. The leadoff man on the bottom of the night. He walked him. Larkin is up. Larkin, 0 for 3, sacrifice once. RBI on a ground ball back in the fifth inning. You know, you would think most pitchers would be more effective at night, wouldn't you? Especially as hard as he throws. Got a good split finger fastball also, but he's got to be in a position to use it. And with Daniels up there, he couldn't throw it because he was always behind. Larkin's up there to punt. So the tying run at first to Daniels. Pitch to Larkin, squares around a butt, takes it for a strike. We've talked about the come from behind ability of the Reds. They're trying to do it again. They've won four of the last five. 57 year old Roger Craig, the LBJ look alike, a little pensive right now. But it back to the mound. Gorelts goes to first, sacrifice complete. One down, and there's the tying run. speed down a second. Davis big cut. Strike one. Boy this place just comes alive when he comes up doesn't it? I think it's quite apparent. It certainly does. It's quite apparent how the Giants are trying to pitch Davis. They have been running that ball in on him all night. Doubtful now that Daniels will run in this situation but he might. He's down in second with one out. Six to five San Francisco. Gerelts inside. One and one. Catchers and pitchers are trained that in game situations late in the game, never get beat with anything but your best. And he is just throwing a high hard one right now. That's right. 
One on one. A little hard ball here. Strength against strength. One one pitch now to Davis. Inside and it's two and one. And he fired that one. Activity Keith Comstock who was up earlier is up throwing now the left hander. Yeah Keith's been up for five innings. <laughs> He's saying, come on Roger. Dave Parker do up next. Two one to Davis. Strike call. Two balls, two strikes, one down. The tie run at second. Rushes him back, and it's full at three and two. Five straight heaters inside to Eric Davis. Well, if you hang something curved or anything, it's a souvenir, so you might as well come with something high and hard. Here we go. 3 2. Popped it up behind the plate. I don't think there's going to be a play. There will not be. Melvin coming back. It's into the screen, and it's still full at 3 and 2. This telecast is presented by Authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Bottom of the ninth, one down, a runner at second. The Reds trailing six to five. And their main man is up there. Three two pitch. He walked him. Two bases on ball. I'll tell you what happened then. Robbie Thompson. Position, the whole right side of the infield was open. Fortunately, Davis draws a walk. And now it might be time for Keith Comstock. That's what's going to be. Roger Craig indicating he wants a left-hander. So Gorelts walking two men here in the bottom of the ninth. Buddy Bell due up next. The Reds have some things going. They trail six to five. We'll come back to Riverfront Stadium. Cincinnati trying to come from behind again. Keith Comstock, who picked up his first major league victory Saturday at the age of 31, played in Japan the last two years. He comes on. He's 1-0, earned run average of 3.18, and Dave Parker. You remember, if you were with us earlier, back in the fifth inning, he made the game 6-5 to five with a tremendous home run, a two-run shot, and here it is. That was the pitch that ran Mike Lacoste, and it almost looked like Mike Lacoste turned around faithfully when Parker hit this shot over the center field wall. He's got another shot to do some damage right now, too. That was his 14th home run of the year. He had one yesterday. Now he could really do some damage. With one out, runners at first and second. Two walks in the inning. Gorelts leaves and Keith Comstock, 31-year-old left-hander, to face the veteran Parker. Wait a minute. Time is called. Third base umpire, Tom Hallion, comes running in. There was a ball on the field. Got away from the bullpen down the left field line. Andy Bacchus now heating up down the left field line, a right-hander who they just called up from Phoenix. With Mark Davis, the left-hander, moved to a starting role. He has been in the bullpen since then. The Giants released Greg Minton and signed Keith Comstock. Brought him up from Phoenix. So, no pitch. First pitch on the way now to Dave Parker.
had to hold up on that ball, and Daniels got a late break. Davis almost ran up his back, but he got home safely. He really did tremendous power once again to straightaway center field for Parker on the first pitch. And I'll tell you, it was a very close play, but watch how Bob Melvin receives the ball. He receives the ball out in front of home plate instead of blocking the plate. Davis and Daniels are holding now. Davis almost laps Daniels. The cutoff throw is a little low. The throw by Thompson. Now watch the position of Bob Melvin, the catcher. Of course, the throw pulled him off, but had he been back a little bit more, then the force of the slide could have warded Davis off by catching the ball on the right foot. That actually puts less pressure on the left one, and Davis could just kick it out of there, and that's what he did. But here you see Daniels had to wait. Now watch Davis. He's on his heels flying when he comes around third base. Look at him. He's right in the back. Here he comes. But watch the position of Melvin. Daniels scores easily. He caught it with his weight on the front foot, and then by the time he shifted, the slide of Davis knocked the left leg of Melvin out of there. Boy, what a play. Dave Parker with four.